Orange Sky Audio presents Mating Cinder, Pride of Alphas, Book 3 by Millie Tayden. Narrated for you by Cassandra Miles. For my amazing supportive friends, I love you. Chapter 1 Cinder Cinder snapped a picture of her plate, a smile tugging at her lips. It took her two seconds to adjust the filter and post the image with a cute and on-brand hashtag. There she goes again, her eldest sister Ember teased. Can't have a meal without taking a picture and showing millions of followers what she's doing, can she? Cinder tossed her hair back dramatically. This pizza is a work of art. And it was, too. The thick golden brown dough topped with melted cheese made her mouth water. They never had pizza for their sister hangouts. Sparks, the middle sister, was a famous actress who always had to look just so. But since Sparks quit her job on a soap opera and shacked up with a sexy tiger shifter mate, she ate like a normal human. Cinder was pleased about it. She missed gorging herself on pizza with her sisters like they used to do before, back when they were kids. Not that the Brady sisters had ever been just kids. Even as little girls, they had been ambitious with their eyes on the prize. Ember was a famous baker, like she always wanted to be. Sparks was a famous and respected actress, just as she had dreamed. And Cinder? Well, she was on her way to get her lifelong dream. If only some people got their heads out of their damn and old asses. She bit into a slice of pizza the tang of the basil in the tomato sauce pulling a happy moan out of her. The cheese was hot, but not too much that it burned the roof of her mouth. It was just right. She quickly took another bite, needing the yummy carbs' warmth to fill the gnawing hole in her stomach. Are you going to tell us why you didn't want to go out for dinner? Sparks asks. I told you, Kai and Dash could totally do security for us if that's what has you worried. Cinder waved her off. That's not it. If I tell you what's happening, I might start to cry or go into a raging rampage. I'd rather not end up on social media as the crazy makeup lady who destroys a restaurant. Ember frowned. What the hell is happening? With a deep sigh and another bite of her pizza, she settled back into her chair. You know how I've been sponsored and paid by all of these big makeup companies to feature their products on my social media, right? Yes, you have the weirdest career in the world, Sparks commented before stuffing half her slice into her mouth. You're one to talk, Cinder snorted. Anyway, I've been making my own products for years too, right? She didn't need to tell her sisters that. They knew. She had experimented on them enough as kids. I've slowly been integrating more and more of my own products in my social media, I even managed to sell a few lip balms and face creams when I did a sweep last month. I got nearly one million new followers from that stunt. The people who tried it are raving. As they should, Amber said, holding up a second slice of pizza in cheers. Well, now everyone wants to have access to the product. I'm just one woman. I don't have the money or rather the resources to make that much makeup. I approached a few companies to see if we could strike up a bargain. They let me use their resources, and I include them in my videos. That's a good deal, Amber pointed out. How exciting. It would be, yes, if the companies I had my eye on were receptive. Allure has been around for a hundred years. They're the ones I want to work with. But when I met with the CEO, he laughed me out of the boardroom. He, Amber asked. He, Sparks repeated. Does he wear makeup? Cinder shook her head. He's a man in his 60s who recently inherited the company from his mother. He has no fucking clue what he's doing. I tried to explain the advantage of working with me, but he says that he can't trust a wet-behind-the-ears little girl who takes too many pictures of herself. He told me to get a degree in business and another in chemistry before he'd even consider working with me. But that would take nearly a decade, Ember gasped. Right? Cinder rolled her eyes. I don't need a business degree to know how to run my shit. 
I've been selling and marketing other people's products since I was old enough to apply fake lashes. Not everyone has the skill to do that as a ten-year-old, Sparks needlessly pointed out. I don't need a chemistry degree to make my makeup. I've been doing it for even longer. I know what I'm doing. So this Allure guy, he won't work with you because you don't have a formal education? Is that right? Ember asked. In this day and age, Sparks clicked her tongue. Right? Cinder took a deep breath, relieved that her sisters understood just the kind of strain she was under. She needed to expand, but she would only do it with a company she respected, one that already had stopped testing on animals and used minimal harsh chemicals to produce their makeup lines. It is so not the age of animal cruelty and chemical makeup. People want to look good and know they are also taking care of the planet. It is so lame, Cinder agreed. So many entrepreneurs don't have degrees. It's the old way of looking at things, and that is totally the point. If he wants his company to stay viable and keep the top position in makeup sales, he will have to modernize and adapt. At least if he was a person who wore makeup, he could understand the importance of... Cinder snapped her mouth shut. I'm babbling, aren't I? Yep, Sparks answered with a smile. We're used to it, Ember agreed. We all do it. A cherished Brady family trait, just like our stubbornness, Sparks continued. If I didn't chat away, my house would be so quiet. Dash talks more than he did before, but he calls me his silence filler. You're making it about you again, Sparks, Ember nudged the actress with an exaggerated eye roll. Is there anything you can do, Cinder, to change this guy's mind? Cinder took another slice of pizza. Was it the second or the fourth? She didn't know and didn't care. Let the cheesy goodness fill the hole in her heart. I've enrolled in a few college classes. Sparks' head snapped up while Ember gasped. You didn't, one said, while the other gasped. Cinder, no. I'm hoping if I'm taking a few classes, it will show good faith. Then maybe Mr. Allure will want to work with me. You're just going to bend to his will in hopes of making a deal? Sparks didn't look pleased. Well, Cinder picked at the pizza crust. His granddaughter is set to inherit the company. She has been a follower of mine for a little while now. I think that if I play up the classes I am taking and meet with her, together we could convince her grandfather to work with me. Sparklers were going off in Sparks' eyes. That is more like you, she beamed with pride. Never let the man get you down, Ember snorted. I mean, sure, but be careful. If you only appear to play by his rules, your deal could be made on shaky ground. Make sure you're only doing this if it lines up with your values. The last thing you want is to be stuck in a business deal with a company that doesn't behave in a way that you can condone. If the granddaughter, Saffron Carlyle, was in charge, it would all be fine. Saffron? Sparks giggled. Whatever, Sparks. Cinder shot back, throwing a pepperoni at her sister. Our parents definitely had a feeling we were going to take the world by firestorm, Ember commented. Did they ever? Cinder was going to get her own makeup line off the ground, whether she had Carlyle's help or not. She was determined, and nothing can stand in the way of a Brady woman. They always get their way. Cinder snapped a picture of the leaf drawn into the foam of her latte. She posted the image with one hand, while the other brought the white and green cup to her mouth. She took a deep gulp of the smooth, hot beverage. After a sleepless night, the double shot of espresso was desperately needed to keep her awake. She had shit to do and a dream to work on. That couldn't happen without gallons of coffee and a little bit of fairy dust. Fairy dust didn't exist, obviously, but Cinder was optimistic that she could achieve anything with her hard work and her go get 'em attitude. Her plans for the day included making a few more lip balms, posting a makeup tutorial, and of course, her first ever college class. At 27, she would be much older than the other people in the class, but she couldn't let that affect her. 
older people went back to school all the time to change careers. The few math classes she would have to take were just a tiny hoop she'd have to jump through to get to where she was going, even if it was just pretending. If she did have fairy dust, she could live her life without mathematics. But Matthias Carlyle was as old school as they come. Cinder's latte post was already liked and commented on a few hundred times, just as she had expected. Pleased, she sat down at one of the small black wooden tables and clicked her screen until she pulled up her to-do list. She needed to make sure she had every ingredient to make her concoctions before heading back to her place. The seat in front of her was suddenly filled with a woman her age, with long ebony hair and angular nose, and cheekbones that would never need any contouring. Cinder tried not to react, but it was difficult. She did not like or trust Magenta Heston. The woman worked for Heston Cosmetics. They were a cutthroat company, and one that Cinder didn't want to represent or align herself with. Too bad they were pursuing her like a bee with a fresh flower. Cinder was too smart to let herself be stung by the Hestons. They would take her products and kick her out of the process. She was sure of it. She'd read too many horror stories about how they comported themselves in business. I told you, Cinder said before taking a deep pull from her drink. I think I have told you about a million times now. I don't want to work with your company. Magenta sipped her own coffee like it was a threat. It would be in your best interest to work with us. Are you threatening me? Cinder crossed her arms and narrowed her eyes to keep from shivering. Because you should know, I am not going to be intimidated into giving away my business. I survived a stalker and some pretty shitty boyfriends. You do not want to mess with me. Magenta's lips curled up into a sneer. There is a lot you don't understand about the world, little Cinder. You might want to reconsider the offer. She looked down at her watch. We'll give you 48 hours to think the terms through. Call me. Magenta dropped the envelope down onto the table, wrapped her knuckles against the paper, and gave a final sneer. Either way, we will see each other again. Doubt it, Cinder stood, grabbing the envelope and dumped it into the trash. She would have recycled it, mindful of the waste, now that her brother-in-law Dash was a conservationist. But this was more of a message to Magenta. Your offer is trash, you bitch, and I am not going to back down. Magenta laughed dryly as she exited the cafe. Cinder finally let the shiver rake up her spine. No amount of piping hot coffee could circumvent the chill Magenta had left behind. The makeup world was an ugly place to have enemies. It wasn't all organic lip balms and sustainable business practices. Some companies were downright animalistic in their dealings. Cinder wanted nothing to do with Heston Cosmetics. Not now, not ever. She'd give up before letting them take her recipes. Hell, she was even willing to go back to school to prove she could do this her way. Cinder rolled her shoulders back, grabbed her coffee, and headed out into the world, confident that she had this. If she had been paying more attention, she would have seen Magenta skulking around the corner. When Cinder hopped into a cab, the other woman followed. Chapter 2. Forest. Forrest Cooper grumbled loudly as he flipped through the pile of pop quizzes on his desk. His brand new red pen was already running low, and he hadn't even made a dent in the pile yet. Any other professor would leave the menial task of grading quizzes to teaching assistants, but his TAs were idiots. They missed crucial details of equations and let too many errors go by unnoticed. Equations were perfect. They were infallible. Too bad his TAs couldn't be cut from the same cloth as him. It would make his life infinitely easier if he wasn't surrounded by people who saw mathematics as a means to an end. Math was a journey strung together with rules and regulations. They were solid and never-changing, 
They were puzzles with answers, unlike people. Forrest could solve a complex equation with minimal effort. Still, he failed to understand why his teaching assistants continuously burst into tears when he gave them orders. They were weaklings, not made for the harsh reality of mathematics. A small knock echoed through his office. What? Forrest barked, assuming Tammy, his current lead TA, had come to cry and snivel at him again. It wasn't the blubbering PhD candidate that walked into his office. It was his boss, John Kramer, the dean of the mathematics department. The older gentleman folded himself into one of the leather chairs, tenting his fingers below his weak chin. What can I do for you, John? Forrest asked, looking down at one of the quizzes. How this could be done by a second-year student was astounding. Didn't these kids know how to study? All math took was a bit of focus, and presto, everything made sense. It wasn't hard, really, for fuck's sake. I am here because a group of teaching assistants came to see me earlier. All four of them are assigned to you, and they all agree that you are too harsh. Some of these students are brilliant minds here on full scholarships, yet they fail to impress you. They can't do their jobs right, Forrest mumbled, scratching his pen down a copy of the quiz, correcting all of the errors as he went along. They're not brilliant, John. At best, they are mediocre. I don't think you understand the position you are putting yourself in, Forrest, this is the third batch of TAs we have given you. You are burning through all of our PhD candidates and most of the master's students. The word has gotten around about your attitude, and no one wants to work with you. Some have said they would rather work in the cafeteria during the fish stick dinner rush than step foot in your office again. One even said she didn't care if we pulled her scholarship. Tammy? Forrest asked finally looking up from the pile of grading. I am not going to give you more ammunition for the poor girl. You have quickly gained a reputation for being impossible to work with. You are a brilliant mathematician, and you are even a good teacher when you want to be. But this, John shook his head, the TAs have threatened to go over my head to the dean of admissions and to the university's chancellor if their professor assignments are not changed. Forrest growled. That is nonsense. Let the chancellor come see me. I will explain that we need to better the standards for our university, or else the diplomas we give out are going to be worthless. Easy now, Forrest. You are not tenured yet. And from what I can tell, you had the same issue at your last university. You are going to have a reputation that will follow you wherever you go, if you don't ease up. TAs are students. If they make mistakes, it's better they make them now, when you are there to teach them, rather than when they are professors themselves, or when they are working on their final thesis. I don't have time to babysit four assistants who don't know the difference between a differential tangent and the square root of four. John clicked his tongue. I am asking you, for your own sake, to be more patient with growing, learning minds. They need to grow up and learn faster if they want to keep up. You leave me no choice, then. Forrest dropped his red pen, crossing his arms. What are you saying, John? I have a bit of an assignment for you, something you need to do to prove that you can be patient. Maybe if you get through it, your tenure will come. Forrest narrowed his eyes. Why do I feel like I won't like this at all? Because you will hate it. The other man smiled with glee. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Then why do you look positively giddy? I think this will be good for you. You might learn a lesson or two of your own, Professor. John sat back in his chair, looking every bit like the cat who ate the canary. In the real world, Forrest was the very big cat and John was the canary. He didn't like this role reversal. We've been approached by a celebrity who wants to take a few classes. 
Now, she is too widely known to take classes in person. As you well know, our university doesn't offer correspondence classes. But the Chancellor and I have come to an agreement. We will overlook this latest bout of TA hunting if you teach this famous pupil private classes. Forrest blinked a few times, stunned into silence. He continued blinking as he waited for John to elaborate. The dean did no such thing. He kept on staring at Forrest with a smirk on his wrinkled face. Private college level classes, he asked. That would cost a small fortune. Yes. How rich, privileged, and annoying is this student? Oh, she's rather well off. Having someone like her on our roster looks very good for the department, and more importantly, looks good for the university. The chancellor fully believes that this could pull in more students for the next term. You know, kids will want to go where their hero goes. The new student will boost our admissions. Forrest's hackles were raised way high. If this was being used as a punishment for making his TAs cry like fools, then it couldn't be good. Would you stop being cryptic and give me all of the details so I can decide if I will do this or not? John laughed a deep belly sound that made his gut rumble. Oh no, Forrest, you misunderstood me. You do not have a choice in the matter. The Chancellor will consider your tenure if you do this. But if you don't, well, you will be given only first-year classes next semester. You won't be given any more assistance, and removal from the staff isn't off the table. You would fire me? Forrest snapped in disbelief. Yes. He shook his head. I can't believe this. I just released one of my best pieces in the university press, and you would be willing to lose my expertise because a few students can't stand the thought of being criticized? There is a way to guide TAs, Forrest, the same way you lead your students through equations. You are a brilliant mathematician, but as a human, John shook his head, you are not so good at that. Maybe this one-on-one -on -one pupil will teach you a few things. Who is this person, then, who is supposed to teach me patience? John's grin got impossibly wider. Have you ever heard of Cinder Brady? Forrest clicked his tongue. Does this girl publish anything of note in the university presses? Did she solve an impossible equation? Obviously not if I have to teach her. Clearly, I've never heard that name before. Cinder Brady is a makeup influencer with quite a bit of a following. Millions of young people watch her videos and follow her as if she were a guru with the answer to life. This could boost our enrollment numbers. She has been asked to take some business classes by an old friend of mine. We are killing two birds with one very large stone here. You get to keep your job, and the university gets exposure. Forrest leaned back in his chair. You are serious. I have to do this. I have to teach a kid math one-on-one -on -one because she has a good social media account? You keep saying kid. This student is a woman, Forrest. She's savvy and has great potential. Just don't make her cry and don't mess this up. If everything goes well, you will be given tenure. And no more first-year classes, Forrest added. Are you trying to negotiate with me? John was amused, but it only served to anger Forrest. Absolutely. If I'm going to suffer the rest of the semester without an assistant and teach a famous airhead how to count, I should get something out of it. Because tenure isn't enough for you, Forrest shook his head. I was warned you were an asshole when I hired you. I didn't expect you to be cutthroat to top it all off. Haven't you heard, John? I make TAs cry for sport. John laughed. This is your shot, Forrest. Don't mess this up. Don't make Cinder cry, and make sure she loves the university enough to organically praise it on her social media. Are we in the business of using social media to sell degrees now? Forrest couldn't believe it. 
When did higher learning get warped into this new dumb craze of posting every meal and snack for the world to see? This was university for fuck's sake. It wasn't a game or something to boast about. Learning is essential and should be taken seriously. We are in the business of surviving, Forrest. We have to stay in touch with the next generations. They are our future, and we must adapt. I am not going to learn how to weep every time someone doesn't agree with me. John laughed. You need a bit of humanity, Forrest. I'm hoping this assignment teaches you a thing or two about patience. You're good with numbers. If you were better with people, you would be dean of the department one day. Forrest sat up straighter. That was precisely what he wanted. John was a few years away from retirement, and it was no secret that Forrest wanted to take up his place. It would mean no classes, but plenty of new opportunities to grow and expand the department. He had ideas, and none of them involved teaching personal classes to the rich and useless. What are you saying? Forrest asked for clarifications. He needed to hear it plain as day to believe it. If you do this without causing Cinder any distress, you will be in the top running for my job. Good, then I agree. John chuckled. Good to know you are already plotting all of the ways to get rid of me. After giving Forrest the details about Cinder, John left. It was an interesting position he'd been put in. Forrest knew he was a good mathematician, and he got away with a lot because of his reputation. It said a lot about his skills that the dean would see fit to give him a shot at deanship, even with his knack for making his assistants cry. It was flattering, but it also told him that he had more power than he initially thought. The university had tipped their hand. They needed him much more than he needed them. All he had to do was teach a silly woman a few equations, and he would be well on his way to making his dreams a reality. Working at a university with little to no interaction with students. Really, it would be a piece of cake. How much trouble could one social media influencer cause? Deep inside of him, his jaguar purred happily at the thought of going for a run to celebrate this almost victory. Cinder Brady was going to learn a few things and be on her merry way. Then, Forrest would be left alone with his numbers, just the way he liked it. Chapter 3 Cinder the campus was a beautiful space. The cobblestone pathways ran across the thick green grass and to red and gray buildings. Cinder could almost feel the learning thrumming through the air. Students played hacky sack on the lawn, burning time between classes and giving their learning brains a break. Others rushed by on their way to the library to study. Cinder imagined what it would be like to be stressed out for a midterm, she had left middle school to be homeschooled, and she had earned her GED at home, just like Sparks before her. Going to college had never been in the plans, and that was a good thing. Cinder had a hard time staying put for too long. She learned better when she could move around. That was probably why she created her makeup at a standing counter. Constant movement was good for the creative juices. It kept her fresh and motivated, Sitting in a three-hour-long lecture was daunting. That's why she had pulled some strings to get a one-on-one -on -one class. Not only would it be better for her as a student, but she didn't want to deal with being recognized on campus. The very last thing she needed was to be worried about her reputation and business if she was seen taking classes. That's why her disguise was necessary today. Her brown hair was braided under her red wig, her green eyes were hidden behind blue contacts, and she had contoured her face differently. Her own mother would never be able to recognize her in this disguise. Hell, even her clothes were different. Cinder would never wear a mini skirt with thigh-high boots, but she was trying to blend in. Maybe even making herself look younger. She hadn't anticipated that so many students would be going to class in leggings or pajamas. 
It was the afternoon. Did these kids roll out of bed in their dorms and lumber into class with bedhead every day? Or was this just a tough Monday for the majority of the students? Cinder didn't know. But if she didn't feel 100% comfortable in her body and disguise, she might have felt self-conscious for sticking out like a sore thumb. It was bad enough that she was starting classes a full three weeks after the start of the semester. Now she was doing it, looking like Julia Roberts in the boutique on Rodeo Drive. The other students, slowly filling into the enormous auditorium, were looking like a horde of zombies. Shit, that girl is carrying a teddy bear as a fucking backpack. Huh. This was definitely not what Cinder had expected when she decided to audit one of the classes. It was special permission she had received from John Kramer, the dean of the mathematics department. He gave her the okay to sit in on a few classes, so long as she blended in with the rest of the students. No one was allowed to audit a class after the first two weeks of a semester. It created a weird sort of precedent, and John was very concerned about giving her special treatment. He was okay with doing it, so long as he didn't get caught. John was an old family friend. It was strange that he was also an old friend of Mr. Allure. The fossil, who thought it was vital for her to have a business degree and a chemistry degree to even be considered for a place at Allure's table. Even if she was bringing her own products and recipes. Men, though. Cinder sat in one of the seats, the squeaky cushion making a god-awful sound. The springs in the seat were old and poked her hard in the back and ass. At least she wouldn't fall asleep. This was highly uncomfortable. She took out a notebook and set it on her lap before jotting down the date. If she was going to audit the class, she would make sure to look like she belonged. But all of those thoughts vanished from her head when the door at the side of the auditorium opened. The man walked in like he owned the place. His long, powerful legs were encased in black slacks. He wore a button-up shirt that was green and did funny things to his hazel eyes. His blonde hair was quaffed back, perfect and meticulous. He was hot. No, that wasn't enough. He was Professor Hot. He carried himself with all of the confidence of a man who trusts his prowess and abilities. He was the very last thing Cinder had expected from a math professor. She had fully anticipated an old curmudgeon who looked more like Einstein and less like a Hemsworth. He dropped his suitcase on a small table before standing at the podium. He slid a hand into his pocket and wrapped his knuckles against the wood. The sound was soft, but so commanding, the conversations resonating through the room stopped. As one, 300 students stopped talking. Hot damn. Professor Cooper commanded a lot of respect and fear to be able to pull that off. Cinder sat up in her chair even catching herself leaning forward as if her body had a mind of its own and wanted to be closer to the sexy man in front of the class. She wasn't into the whole professor-student stuff she saw in movies. It always felt a little gross because of the age difference and because the professor was in a power position. But at that moment, she understood. Besides, it wasn't like their age difference was all that big. She was almost 30, and she would bet the man wasn't yet 40. Cool your jets, Cinder. You'll be having private lessons with him. Lock this crush down quick, because you need him to teach you all of the math so you can get Mr. Moldy Allure to work with you. She squared her shoulders and gripped her notebook tightly. She was a serious woman on a mission. A nice ass, a square jaw, and eyes that flashed dirty things wouldn't deter her from her goal. When Professor Cooper opened his mouth, she was done for. Math had never been so riveting. The first half of the three-hour-long lecture was interesting enough. Cinder could mostly keep up with what Professor Hotass said. She only let her focus slip somewhat when he turned to write an equation on the board. Then his ass and muscular back were on full display, and it made it harder for her to pay attention. Good Lord, when was the last time she had satisfying sex? There are not enough batteries in the world for that, 
her libido shouted when Professor Melting Panties clenched his ass. Why was he clenching his butt? Was it in her imagination? What was happening to her? She sat up, took a deep breath, and focused. You, Professor Cooper called out, pointing a finger. Right in her fucking direction. Had she moaned out loud? Did he know she was lusting after him? Could he tell she was imagining what it would be like to have him put her on the desk and fuck her hard and fast? Not in front of a crowd. Ew, she wasn't an exhibitionist. But maybe if the 300 other students could fuck off so she could get her fuck on. Must I repeat myself? He asked with an exasperated sigh. Come, complete the equation using the theory I've just explained. Cinder swallowed hard. No, thank you. I think I'll give someone else a chance to answer. There was a collective gasp, followed by a collective groan, when Professor Cooper stiffened at her words. I beg your pardon, he snapped. I said I don't want to do math in front of a full auditorium. That was just asking to be mocked. She was smart, but she hadn't done equations beyond fractions in years. The math she used wasn't in any way this complex. If she failed in a crowded room, her fragile ego would never recuperate. Are you a student in this class? She gulped. Shit, did he know? Had John not warned him that she had to remain anonymous? Yes, she lied. It was sort of true. Maybe she should have introduced herself to him before the class to avoid this little display. Fuck, but this was awkward. He was staring her down with those burning hazel eyes of his. Just go before he assigns us another essay, her neighbor hissed in a fury. Cinder gulped. I don't want to, she whispered. Too bad, Professor Cooper said, holding out a piece of chalk. Shit, how had he heard that? Did he have super hearing or something? Cinder stood, immediately regretting her miniskirt. She pulled at the garment as she made her way to the front of the class. Every pair of eyes was drilling a hole in her back. I'll make a mistake, she whispered to him. Professor Cooper's nostrils were flared, a scowl pulling at his handsome face. He looked almost murderous, like he wanted to devour her. Cinder was pretty sure that if they had been alone in the auditorium, he would have eaten her alive. You know, if math professors could munch on a terrified student. You better not, he warned, crossing his arms. Cinder went to the board and slowly started the process of completing the equation. She shot furtive glances behind her, getting cues from the other students if she made a mistake. Obviously, if she made a mistake, the entire student body would be getting more homework. She couldn't fail, not when she was only auditing the class. With shaking hands, she wrote the answer and stepped away. Professor Cooper grumbled something under his breath. Well, he asked, are you waiting for a participation ribbon? Take your seat. With a squeak, Cinder rushed back to her seat and held her notebook close, as if the thin paper could protect her from the grumpy but hot professor. You almost fucked up, her seatmate said through clenched teeth. If you don't want to be called on, don't sit in front. Weren't you there for the first class? Cinder shook her head. I'm only auditing, she said, even though John had warned her to keep it to herself. The words were out of her mouth before she could remember her top secret presence on campus. The young woman rolled her eyes. Idiot, then you should have said that to him. You almost gave us more homework. Sorry. We'll break for five minutes, Professor Grumpy Hotness announced. As one, the students leaped to their feet, no doubt heading to the bathroom to get some distance from their professor. A few students stretched out their hands, their muscles exhausted from the extensive notes they'd taken during the lesson. Cinder took a deep breath and made her way back to the front of the auditorium. I wanted to apologize. I didn't mean to bring your authority in question earlier, I'm auditing the class, and I didn't know if I would be able to complete the equations. Then you shouldn't be auditing the class, he responded, without looking up from his notes. 
Now, if you'll please go take your break. I need distance from silly students. Cinder blinked at him. You're a little bit rude. His head snapped up, his eyes burning and full of that hunger again. Repeat that, I dare you. You are rude. I did the best I could, and if this is how you treat your students, I am not sure I can hold up my agreement with John. Oh, no, you don't. I won't have another sniveling student messing with my future plans. I expect to see you during my office hours tomorrow. We'll discuss this further. Now, I believe I asked for some distance. He turned on his heels and left the auditorium. Cinder watched him go, shocked and slack-jawed. John had warned her that Forrest Cooper could be a little bit brash and harsh, but this was something else entirely. Cinder didn't know if he wanted to fuck her or make her cry because she forgot PEMDAS. You have to solve parentheses before doing any of the other equations. It was a basic thing, but he made her so nervous she had almost messed up. If this was the man who would teach her math to get Mr. Mothball Allure to work with her, she had her work cut out for her. Grumpy professor or not, Cinder wasn't going to let this deter her plans. She was a Brady, and Brady women always got their way. Chapter Four, Forest. Fuck, fuck, fucking fuck. Forrest paced the length of the hallway, running a hand back through his hair over and over again. This was bad. No, it was worse than bad. This was a fucking disaster. How was this even possible? There was no way that the woman he had to teach was his mate. Not when she was going to prance around, smelling like the best snack in the world, wearing a scrap of material that barely covered her ass. Did she think that counted as a skirt? Because it fucking didn't. Forrest hadn't been able to focus the second he walked into the auditorium. Something was different, and he had immediately felt it. Someone smelled divine, and his jaguar had nearly burst through his skin to see where the scent came from. On a hunch, he had called on the pretty redhead in the damnable half-skirt. What he hadn't expected could have cost him his career. The snarky woman was infuriating. She's our mate. You can't talk about her like that. Forrest ignored his beast. The dumb cat hadn't stopped mewling since the redhead had taken the chalk from his hand. It was a mistake. Obviously, there was no way that at 37 years old, he was meeting his mate. Not in an auditorium full of students. Not when he was so close to being on the shortlist for the deanship. Not that woman and her ridiculous clothes. Forrest would have nothing to do with her. He would ban her from the classroom, and he would insist on doing all of their classes by video. That way, he wouldn't have to breathe the same air as her. Then, his jaguar could get his head on straight and stop clamoring for the woman who was decidedly not their mate. How was he supposed to go back to the class and teach for another hour and a half when the animal in his head wasn't letting up? When the woman had marched right up to him at the break, Forrest had been sure he would kiss her in front of all the other students. That was not how a dean behaved. If I promise to take you out for a very long run in the woods, will you stop bugging me about that woman? The jaguar shook his furry head in the back of Forrest's mind. She is our mate, and I've waited a long time to find her. You have too, but you're too much of an idiot to admit it. Forrest snorted out a breath. He was by no stretch of the imagination an idiot. He graduated from high school at 15, finished his undergrad in two years, his master's in one. Then he'd gone to his PhD, when some others were still sure that spending a gap year traipsing around Europe was a good idea. He was not an idiot. If you can't recognize your mate and our chance at true love, then yes, you're a moron, just like John said. You're good with numbers, but you have no idea how to behave with people. 
Forrest raised his chin high and cracked his neck, first to the left, then to the right. He wouldn't let his jaguar gang up on him, using John's words. He was a professional, and he would do what he did best, play with numbers. He marched himself back into the auditorium and began teaching a full two minutes before the break was over. The students were already back in their seats, ready to take notes. They were used to his temper and knew that when he was done with his break, he would jump back into the lesson, no matter how many people had returned to their seats. He wasn't their friend or their father. If they wanted to be serious scholars, they could hold in their urine or urges to post and share every little boring thought with the rest of the world. Mate, his jaguar chanted in his head for the rest of the lesson, proving once and for all that cats are the most stubborn creatures in the world. The mandatory office hours were a pain in his ass. Forrest didn't like leaving his office door open for two hours every week. A long line of students would come to his door, asking for clarification, begging for extensions on homework, or whatever else the freshmen thought relevant. When he taught the juniors and seniors, his office hours were a little more engaging. He could find himself discussing things like P versus MP, or the Hodge conjecture. He could talk about the remaining six millennium prize problems, impossible math problems, for hours. If a student wanted to discuss the seventh problem, the Poincaré conjecture that had been solved, he was in heaven. But the first years were not great conversationalists. They were too wet behind the ears and were still intimidated by some numbers. Maybe if he wasn't so concerned about the visit of a certain redhead, Forrest would have pulled up his own work on P versus MP. But his eyes kept drifting to the door every time he heard a bit of noise. That was almost every two seconds with his shifter hearing. There were only ten minutes left to his two-hour time slot when a brunette with soft curls, pretty green eyes, and tits to make a grown man weep walked in. Mate, his jaguar forced Forrest to his feet with the loud roar filling his mind. There had to be a mistake. This wasn't the red-headed student who gave him grief yesterday, if his jaguar claimed this stranger was his mate too, then the beast was having some kind of dangerous episode. His mate detection senses were on the fritz, thus proving he couldn't trust his animal. You're a fucking moron. It is the redhead. Look at those eyes. It's her. Well, shit, the beast was right. The woman no longer had a shock of red hair to rival a certain mermaid. It's the same woman. It wasn't. It couldn't be. This made no sense. The other woman had long red hair. This woman's hair was the perfect chocolate brown shade. The loose curls framed her face beautifully, making him dizzy. Or maybe it was his jaguar pouncing on his brain that left him destabilized. You, he grumbled. Me, she said, taking a seat in one of the chairs without an invitation. It would have irked him if he wasn't so desperate to sniff her some more. She smelled like lemon and honey, a strange mix that went straight to his cock. He sat back down before she could spot the outline of his thickening erection. Now that she was in his small office, it would be impossible to get rid of her delicious odor for weeks. It would drive him mad. He had to get rid of her and fast. Not a chance. We have to get to know her. I think we got off on the wrong foot yesterday. I'm Cinder Brady. She held out her hand over the desk, expecting him to touch her. That wouldn't be happening anytime soon. He crossed his arms and gave her his best stare down. Cinder Brady, the famous social media darling who wants to learn some math. She narrowed her eyes at him. You don't have to be such a jerk about it. I want to learn as much from you as I can, but that won't be possible if you keep behaving like a grumpy sourpuss. Grumpy and sourpuss are synonyms. Cinder took his nameplate and flipped it around for him to see. It says professor of mathematics, not English. Am I in the right place? The mouth on her. He pursed his lips. Why were you wearing a wig in class yesterday? I tend to be recognized. 
I don't want my followers to know I'm taking classes. I would be flooded with demands for selfies and autographs. I take this class very seriously. I want to succeed, and I can't do that if I'm distracted. As John explained, I'll talk about the classes I took here in the past tense. It'll boost the admissions. John wants to attract more young women to the mathematics and sciences department. Women belong in STEM, don't you know? Her smile was adorable and delicious. He wanted to kiss it right off of her mouth. He did agree with her. There were too many old men in the STEM departments in the university. Some of the most brilliant minds in mathematics were women. But he was surprised a social media fiend thought this. When he told her as much, her face flushed. Do you even know what I do? Makeup tutorials, he answered with a sneer. Right, but some of the makeup I use, I made, using science. I might be famous on social media because I can rock a killer smoky eye and do the perfect wing in one stroke. Still, people want my organic and cruelty-free makeup. I made it all in-house, by hand. Damn, that was pleasantly surprising. If Cinder could create her own makeup concoctions, it meant she was one sharp mind. It wouldn't be as hard to teach her as he initially thought. If only she wasn't his mate, it would make things a hell of a lot easier for him to cope with. Why do you need to take math classes? He asked. I want to do business with an old school man who thinks you need a college degree to do anything. But I bet I could whip his butt in chemistry classes. Despite himself, he chuckled. Do you have a chemistry degree? She shook her head. You don't need it to succeed, not in today's world. A lot of great entrepreneurs don't have degrees. Right, but a lot of them got into Ivy League schools. I could have gotten in if I applied, she shot back, with the confidence of someone who believed her words. Is that right? He had gotten into Harvard at 15, but he wouldn't point that out just yet. I did my GED and focused on my career. At the time, I wanted to be a makeup artist, but my goals have changed now. I want to make organic, cruelty-free makeup mainstream. It is the 21st century. We know better than to put cancer-causing lipstick on our lips and harming innocent animals to look good. This caught his attention. You care for animals? Of course. Why should animals have to suffer for my skincare regime? He nodded. Fair point. He found he was leaning forward to be closer to her. It wouldn't do. Cinder Brady was not his mate, and he would not let himself believe that she was. That was only inviting disaster into his very well-planned-out life. I think it is best if you don't come to the class anymore. I don't want to cause a distraction for the other students. I will give a private class via video call once a week. You will have to do most of the work by yourself, and I fully expect you to do this. After all, you are a grown woman. I won't hold your hand through this. Do you understand? She blushed, not in embarrassment. She smelled angry. Fine. As a grown woman, I will figure it all by myself. Don't worry. The better sex is used to being underestimated by the likes of men like you. Cinder stood up and flipped her hair over her shoulder. I didn't think it would be such an imposition on your time to teach me. After all, this university is all about higher learning and helping its pupils learn what they need to succeed in their chosen fields. I don't know when you decided that you could judge who merits this education, but you're not. The judge, I mean. The dean of admissions and his staff take care of that. Do your job, Professor Cooper. Teach me some math so I can prove to one of your kind that I can do this. One of my kind? He growled. Yeah. A man who goes around underestimating women. Without another word, Cinder left his office, leaving her sweet and sharp scent behind. Forrest was stunned into silence. That very rarely happened to him. He could argue most people under the table. He needed a long hike through the woods as a jaguar to clear his mind. He had to teach Cinder for a few months, and then he would be rid of her once and for all. Then, he could pretend he had never met his mate. We'll see, his animal threatened.
Chapter 5 Cinder Cinder couldn't believe it. The gall Forrest Cooper had. The way he had talked to her. Like she was nothing more than a silly little woman who wanted to learn how to count. The man made no damn sense. He looked at her like she was an ice cream cone he wanted to lick, but spoke like she was an annoying thorn in his side. He seemed impressed with her goals, then berated her for how she had gotten there. It shouldn't bother her. Cinder didn't give a shit about what men thought. She was only doing the math classes to make sure Mr. Allure of the past worked with her. But he wasn't her end goal. His granddaughter was. Cinder had the distinct feeling that the old man was standing in his own granddaughter's way. He needed to retire and let the women take over. Just like Forrest needed a good roll in the hay to unclench his ass. Oops, that wasn't quite right. That wasn't what she was thinking at all. Forrest needed to realize that he came across as a math snob. Like a lot of stuffy university types, he was judgmental as hell. She wouldn't be the first one to teach him the error of his ways, but she did feel bad for whatever woman saddled herself to a man like that. Cinder knew she wouldn't be able to abide by it, not when she was so damn proud of the social media presence she had built. Cinder had started working when she was a tiny girl, and she had not stopped hustling hard to get to where she was. Forrest Cooper wouldn't belittle that because he didn't understand her goals. She would suffer through his classes and do the homework he assigned. That was it. She wouldn't think about him again. Not when she was in the shower, not when she was fast asleep. This morning's sexy dream and subsequent pleasure hour with her showerhead were slip-ups. Definitely not something she would be recreating. Forrest might be hot. He might smell absolutely delicious. But he was a prick. She wouldn't forget that. Miss Brady, he said once the video call connected. I trust you did the assigned reading and homework I sent you last night? She had. It had taken hours. But she had seen him coming from a mile away. He was trying to trip her up. I sure did. Do you have any questions? I don't. I sent you the assignment just like you asked. You did? His face flushed. I didn't receive the email. Oh, I sent it just now. See? Two could play this game. He wanted to send her piles of homework 12 hours away from her first lesson. She would send the homework back as class started. You worked fast. Fast, but well. I think you will find no mistakes. I did the work and reviewed it carefully and corrected the few hiccups I found. He puckered his lips, and even through the screen, she wanted to kiss him. The attraction made no damn sense to her. All of her exes were burly physical fitness movers and shakers. She had dated one singer-songwriter, but his tendency to cry every time they had sex was too much for her. She liked a sensitive guy who could express his feelings, but having your boyfriend cry on your tits because he couldn't give you an orgasm? All to the nope. It didn't matter that she had told him how to improve his technique. He hadn't learned, and he had kept up his underwhelming sex performance. There were only so many ways she could tell him to jerk off so that he would last longer when they were together. Cinder knew Forrest wouldn't have that same problem. He could probably satisfy a woman just by laying those sexy hands of his on her. Cinder gulped, stopping short of fanning herself because she felt too heated. Unaware of the impact he had on her, Forrest launched into a long explanation of some mathematical theory or another. Cinder didn't pay any attention. She couldn't focus on his words, too distracted by the man himself. It was a good thing that doing her GED had taught her to be a self-learner, or she'd be screwed with a capital S. She would do some reading and figure out what the hell he was going on about. This is what Mr. Allure of the geriatric and Forrest didn't understand. Some people did better on their own, learning at their own speed, whether very fast or very slow. Are you even paying attention to me? Forrest snapped after a while. Yes, of course, she answered without missing a beat. Hmm, he didn't believe her. 
That became obvious when he sent her a math problem by email and demanded that she solve it. It was almost as bad as being called out in front of the whole class as he had done the day before. Cinder began to work as Forrest watched her. It was unsettling. This isn't going to work, she snapped. I can feel you gawking at me, and it's seriously messing with my focus. Do you think you could occupy yourself for a second while I figure this out? It would be infinitely better if I could see what you were doing. That way, I could correct you if you run into any problems. I won't. You might, but I won't, she argued, knowing she was definitely stuck. Not that she would admit that to Professor Grumpy. I'll hang up the video call and get back to you in a minute. Oh, no, you don't. How could I know you won't cheat? Cinder clicked her tongue. Because I am a grown-ass woman, this education is important to me, and if I were to cheat, I would only be cheating myself. Forrest puckered his lips at her. I think perhaps it was a bad idea to do this by video chat. Is there some place we could meet, a public space off campus where we could pick this up? Cinder breathed a sigh of relief. If he had asked to meet in her place, or his, she would have gotten some pretty naughty ideas about Professor Sexy. Meeting in person meant she would have to be in disguise, and it would also mean that she wouldn't get the benefit of nodding off while he talked endlessly. The things I do for my dreams, she mumbled to herself a few hours later as she headed toward the cafe near her condo. Standing outside of the cafe by the large bay window, Cinder observed Forrest. He was reading something on his laptop. Handsome face pulled into a deep frown of focus. He was just so hot. She wasn't the only woman who thought so. The cafe was full of women, from teens to elderly biddies with white hair, and they all looked over at him every now and again. He had this gravity pull about him, you can't fuck your professor, she repeated to herself for the millionth time. He was a dirty dream wrapped in sex appeal, but he was too grumpy for her taste. Both of her sisters had fallen in with grumpy shifters, but that was not her jam. Cinder was into the comical sort of guy who could make her laugh. Her exes might all have been meatheads, but they were hilarious. There was nothing funny about Forrest unless she counted how funny it was that a mere glimpse of his square jaw had her pussy clenching in desperation. Seriously, she needed to get herself to a doctor, real soon. Maybe strange hormones were just a thing women got as they edged closer to 30. Instead of menopause, she was having some kind of sexual revelation where the only thing she wanted to do was sit on Forrest's face or let him have his way with her. She banished the thought, squared off her shoulders, and walked into the cafe. The second she opened the door, Forrest sat up, his eyes finding hers. His nostrils flared like she was a delicious little pastry that had just walked into the space. His hazel eyes were on fire, flashing with something purely animalistic, something wild. Why did they have to meet? She was in danger of doing something indecent if he kept looking at her like that. Cinder. Her name in his grumpy, rumbly voice made her heart flutter. How a man could appear annoyed with you and attracted all at once was a mystery to her. Hey, she said as she plopped down in the seat in front of him. You're wearing a disguise again, he points out. He eyed the wig like it was full of bugs. Why do you have to wear a disguise everywhere you go? I do this because I am easily recognized. People have no sense of boundaries. A lot of people have sort of grown up with me. They've been watching my videos since I was a kid. They feel like they know me, like we're friends. It's not bad, necessarily, but I disguise myself when I want some privacy. If I wasn't wearing the wig and contacts... I'd be fielding some conversation with a few of the patrons in here. This one time, I was in the bathroom of a restaurant, and this group of girls approached me and asked if I could fix their makeup. In a public bathroom? Forrest's shock was palpable. That's hardly appropriate. I know. Hence the wig and blue contacts. 
Don't think I'm complaining about it. I love my job, and I love my viewers. But I also love my anonymity. Then why not stop? Forrest leaned in, a concerned frown knitting his brows together. Because it's my job. If I can get my makeup line off the ground, I'll be able to spend more time creating things instead of spending all of my time doing videos. It's a chance to expand away from doing only the videos. I've grown up since I started. Matured, you could say. I want to do more, but also... She stopped, short, shaking her head. But also, Forrest prompted. Why was he so interested in what she had to say? First, he had called her up to the blackboard to answer a math question in front of hundreds of people. Then, he had given her shit in his office. Then, he had been grumpy about the video call class he set up. Now, here he was, leaning in and focusing those hazel eyes of his on her like she was the most interesting thing in the world. Cinder had been on enough bad first dates in this very cafe to know what this felt like. It was starting to feel like a strange first date, not a math class. Never mind, she finally answered. It doesn't matter. Doesn't it? Forrest leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. My parents, my entire family are zoologists. My sister even married another zoologist she met while doing her PhD in Peru. When I announced that I would be going into mathematics instead of the chosen family field, I think I broke my parents' heart a bit. They supported me, but didn't understand my need to break away. They'd already done so much in the field, I wanted to do something new. Something that would be all mine, where I could excel without their shadow. Oh, wow. I'm sharing this with you, Cinder, to point out that I can understand wanting to grow away from the past. In my opinion, you don't need to feel like you're betraying your fans, or whatever you call them. Everyone is allowed to grow. Cinder nodded. I know that, but I still have this fear that I'll fail. And then what? If I don't have my videos, I'm not sure what I'll be if I can't make this makeup thing work. What would I do? These math classes are a very dumb hoop I have to jump through to get where I'm going. I don't like that I have to do this, but I also want to succeed more than you could possibly know. Forrest smirked. It was, well, there had never been a hotter set of lips. He was a good-looking man. He could turn a nun's head, he was so hot. But when the man smirked, it did something to the air in the cafe. It ignited it with a weird sort of tension that made her mouth water, her pussy clench, and her heart do a few cartwheels. If you want to succeed, then let's begin with the lesson, he said, pulling out a notepad. She blinked at him, confused by his new warm attitude. She wanted to call him out on it, but he was already pushing the notebook toward her with a math equation to solve. If you can solve this in two minutes, I'll get you a slice of cake. You're on, she shot back with a smile. Prepare to ply me with cake. Chapter Six, Forrest. In all of his life, Forrest Cooper had never been confused, not once. Oh, he'd been frustrated by new mathematical theories, and a few equations made his head spin because he couldn't solve them, just like every other genius in the world. But puzzles never phased him. He could solve those in record time, seeing where every piece went. It was like the final product built itself in his mind with ease, Cinder Brady was a puzzle he didn't know how to solve. In his mind's eye, he could see the end result of their time together. It was clear as day. But the one thing that was causing him great distress was that he couldn't figure out how to get to the part where they were mates. That was not at all clear. In fact, it was worse than the unsolvable P versus NP equation he plucked away at every time he had a free moment. It's really simple, his jaguar chided. You made her. There, it doesn't have to be this big, complicated thing. You're overthinking it like you always do. You pounce, then eternal happiness. Easiest equation ever. 
Cinder's head was bowed over the notebook as she scribbled away the solution to the equation he gave her. Every few moments, she would push away from it only to frown down at the paper. Her perfect white teeth dug into the tender flesh of her pink lips as she thought. It was adorable and alluring all at once. Forrest had the biggest urge to leap over the table and bite her lip too, before dropping a soft kiss there. Then just do it. She wants us, you can tell, can't you? Or is your big math brain stopping you from being a good shifter? The beast was way out of line. The animal had been weeping for a mate for a long time now. No matter how many times Forrest repeated that they didn't need to find a mate, the jaguar insisted that they did. Now, sitting across from Cinder, it was impossible to resist the pull. But he had to banish every molecule of want and desire pulling him toward her. She was his student. If John heard that Forrest had done things with his pupil, he could kiss his potential tenure goodbye. He rolled his shoulders back and focused on the numbers Cinder jotted down. He interrupted her a few times to clarify the lesson. It ended up being more like a private tutoring session than a class, but Cinder was smart as hell. She caught on quick. Her intellect was as keen and as sharp as his. That realization was nearly as sexy as the woman herself. Math isn't sexy. The fact that you think so is proof that you need to get laid. Good thing you found your mate. His jaguar was an incessant chattering pest in the back of his mind. But Forrest was used to ignoring the big kitty. In fact, referring to the beast as a harmless kitten always did buy him a few moments peace. A full hour passed sitting in the cafe, poring over equations and theories. When it was finally time to go their separate ways, Forrest was desperate to find a reason to stick around Cinder. I owe you a slice of cake, he grumbled, pushing to his feet. He walked to the large display case and ordered two slices of chocolate cake and two fresh coffees. He put the snack down on the table and noticed that Cinder was watching him, a frown pulling at her delicate features. You know you come across as this ornery man, but then you teach me math for an hour and get me cake as a reward. Forrest shrugged. A brain needs carbs to function, and you just burned a lot of carbs with all of those equations. I'm just looking out for you. Well, thank you. Cinder dug into her dessert, bringing the fork to her mouth. He knew he should look away, but he was transfixed by the way her lips cleaned the icing from the fork's prongs. Her scent mixed in with the dark chocolate, making him dizzy. This is the best cake I've ever had, she moaned, her eyes closed and head thrown back. Her slender neck was on full display, and he had to curb the urge to lick the smooth skin. If you're not careful, I'll demand that all of our classes end with some kind of sweet reward. Oh, we'll show you a sweet reward, the jaguar purred. Forrest shuffled in his chair, aware that a particular part of his anatomy had responded to Cinder's moans. I suppose that it could serve as an incentive to pay attention, but perhaps we shouldn't meet in public if you have to disguise yourself. He wanted to sit across from his mate in her natural state. Though she was still beautiful with her red wig and blue eyes, he knew just how stunning she was with her rich brown hair. He missed the green of her eyes, even though he had only seen the color once. I appreciate that, but where? You want to come to my apartment? Have me go to yours? Wouldn't your wife mind if you had a student popping in twice a week? Ha, <laughs> she is fishing for information. I'm unattached, Forrest mentioned with a shrug. You won't be for long since you've met our mate. Just tell her, she'll understand, and then we can take a slice of cake home and eat it off her naked body. Nipples dipped in chocolate sounds really good, doesn't it? For fuck's sake. But his beast was an insufferable creature. Oh, Cinder pushed her dessert around the white plate, streaking icing in a pattern on the porcelain. I honestly thought you were married or something. No, I'm not. Married to the numbers, huh? He chuckled. Something like that, yes. 
I was a precocious child, always had my nose in a book. I started college when I was 15. That didn't exactly give me many opportunities to date. 15? She gasped. Shit, at 15, all I had was GED class and a few million followers on my social media channel. That's impressive in its own way. Is it? Just please don't tell me you went to a fancy school. A smile pulled at his lips, and she noticed. You're an Ivy Leaguer, aren't you? She asked. Many times over. She rolled her eyes with no real ire. She was amused. Of course, you're a genius. It fits with your whole vibe, she gestured to him. Forrest looked down. He was wearing a pair of dark gray slacks with the matching coat, a midnight blue button-down shirt, and a thin black tie that matched his shoes and belt. My whole vibe, he asked. Yes, you exude some pretty big genius energy, kind of like you know you're the smartest person in the room. You get aggravated when people around you don't catch on as fast. But you need to have patience with us normal folks. We can't all be math geniuses, you know? Give us the time to catch up, have a little patience, and maybe then you wouldn't be so frustrated all the time. He frowned. I'm not frustrated all the time. Her laugh was soft. Sure, if you say so. You forget that I've seen you in class. You have a hard time accepting other people's limitations. Cinder was right. Of course she was. Forrest did spend most of his time frustrated with his teaching assistants and his students. After all, they couldn't keep up because they weren't on his level. Even some of his colleagues weren't on his level. How they had managed to get tenure above him was a mystery. Could it be because they were better teachers? They understood the students in a way he didn't because numbers had always been so easy for him to understand. Well. This was quite a revelation. Here he was, trying to teach Cinder about math. And in return, the discerning woman was teaching him about himself. It's because she is our mate. She understands us. That's why you have to walk her home. Make sure she's safe and all that. It was a transparent ploy to spend more time with her. But Forrest didn't care. He would deal with his raging feelings for Cinder later when he got home. He would verify that she was off limits, and it would be the end of that. Okay, his jaguar snorted. You go right ahead and keep on believing that. Passion for your subject is important, but maybe try to make your students fall in love with the numbers the way you fell. I do that all the time with new makeup products in my videos. I know what to say and how to present it to make sure my viewers love it just as much. This is a very interesting spin on my career. Keep it in mind next time you call a student to the front. Do you have any idea how nerve-wracking it is to stand in front of hundreds of people and try to resolve an equation? I did it. I bet you even raised your hand. I can see it now, a teenage forest lifting his hand and pretty much forcing the professor to listen to you while the older and less gifted students groan at you. Forrest threw his head back with a deep belly laugh. How could she possibly know that? It was like she had been there, calling him out with perception. It wasn't my fault that the professor had made an error in his calculations. I had to correct him. Cinder's eyes went wide. You did not, she gasped. A 15-year-old student correcting the professor in front of a whole class? How embarrassing for that person. Did the other students hate you? I bought my first car with the money I made tutoring them. They didn't hate me, but they weren't fans either. Aw, I feel kind of bad for young Forrest, but you're proving my point for me. You need to chill and give people the time to catch up to you. Yes, I see the errors of my ways now, Cinder. Something passed between them when their eyes met. It wasn't quite an electric current, but it zinged him nonetheless. Cinder blushed deeply, and she toyed with the tips of her hair. Forrest looked away, the strange tenderness of the moment staying around them a bit too long. I should walk you home, he finally said after clearing his throat. Oh, you don't have to do that. I live really close to here. It's not exactly like this is a dangerous neighborhood. 
Please, I insist. Cinder blinked at him, the red of her cheeks going even redder. The air around them was scented with the most delectable perfume, Cinder's desire for him. Forrest knew he couldn't act on it for multiple reasons, but walking her home was the gentlemanly thing to do. He would keep his lust in check and his hands to himself. He could do that. If you say so, his jaguar snorted. Cinder stood, grabbing the notebook while Forrest cleared away the table of their snacks. They headed out of the cafe, shoulders brushing. You touched her. He had, but not with his hands. It was a loophole. He could keep his hands off of Cinder if their shoulders kept on brushing against each other. It's this way, Cinder said as they walked up to a fork in the road. The pair veered left, using a small alley. No sooner had they turned down the narrow road than Forrest knew. Something was very wrong. The two lions across the street staring them down was indication enough. They were about to be attacked. Chapter 7 Cinder Cinder wanted to scream, but the sound died in her throat, too confused to be let out. This was the middle of a busy city. This was a posh neighborhood known to house celebrities of all kinds. Did one of them have illegal pets? Because that could be the only logical explanation as to why two lions were staring at them from across the street. Cinder had never felt like a juicy steak before, but at that moment, that is exactly what she felt like. Forrest reached out an arm and pushed her behind him, putting himself between her and the lions. It was a chivalric move, but it was also dumb as hell. Did he really believe he could save her from not one, but two vicious wild animals? Even if Forrest inherited all of his family's zoological skills and knowledge, how was he supposed to defend them from the two large predators? The lions were actually lionesses. They didn't have the red mane crowning their heads. Don't move, Forrest whispered through clenched teeth. When I say duck, I want you to drop to the ground and find a safe place to hide. Go back to the main road or go into one of the buildings around us. But do not argue with me, he snapped. Cinder gulped. She wasn't a fan of being ordered around, but this wasn't exactly a regular occurrence. For the life of her, she couldn't remember the last time she had seen a lion. It was probably when she had gone to the zoo as a little girl. But the big cats weren't supposed to be walking around downtown like they owned the place. One of the large predators padded forward with a low growl. Forrest growled back. He growled back. Was this some kind of zoology magic he was trying to pull? Because from her vantage point, they were about to become kitty chow. Duck, Forrest ordered. Cinder hit the pavement. Her wig went flying, but she didn't care. They were about to be eaten. Might as well go out looking like herself instead of her top secret persona. When Cinder was face first on the stinky, dirty pavement, she looked up to see a pile of gray and blue clothes on the ground where Forrest had been standing. The man had melted. In his place stood a jaguar, the massive beast hissing at the two incoming lions. She blinked, shook her head, and looked up again. Had she hit her head? Maybe dropped some acid without realizing it? Had there been some weed in the cake? Because this made no sense. The jaguar launched itself at the first lion, jowl wide open. The other animal made a terrifying noise when the jaguar bit down on its neck. The second lion wasted no time, joining the fray with a roar. Cinder knew she had something to do. Forrest had asked her to do something, but she couldn't remember what. She was frozen in fear, watching three massive beasts duke it out. It was as the jaguar was sent sprawling that she remembered a crucial detail. She recently learned of the existence of shifters. Both of her sisters were now mated, one to a tiger and the other to a lion. How many fucking shifters could there be in the world? Forrest was one. The two lions were shifters, too. 
Cinder would stake her life on it. Knowing that the beasts were humans morphed into animals didn't help her fear. Sure, they weren't creatures with only one intent, feeding. They still posed a problem. Why were they attacking her and Forrest? Did he cause some kind of shifter problem? It did seem that trouble always found shifters. Ember had been attacked by some, and Sparks had been kidnapped by more. Was it her turn? Cinder Army crawled behind a large green dumpster. The stench made her eyes water. Or maybe it was watching a jaguar forest fighting off two opponents that had her on the verge of tears. She grabbed her phone and dialed the emergency services. The operator quickly answered, asking for the nature of the emergency. Cinder paused. What in the hell could she say without sounding like a deranged, rambling lunatic? Ma'am, what is the emergency? The operator snapped. There are three wild animals in the small alley behind Baker Street. The woman blew out a breath. Sure there are, hun. What's your name? My name is Cindy Lou Who. I'm not lying. There are wild animals here. You need to send someone in case he gets hurt. Who will get hurt? Is someone being attacked? It was a pointless conversation. Cinder hung up the call and edged forward to see beyond the dumpster. One of the lions was laying on the ground, bleeding from a large gash in its side, while the other was locked in what looked like a full-body hug with the jaguar. I've called 911, she screamed at the top of her lungs. The cops will be here in a few minutes. Do you hear those sirens? They are on the way. It was a bald-faced lie, but the lions couldn't know that. The city was busy, and there was always one siren or another going off. The lion growled in her direction, but leaped away from the jaguar, inching back, never taking its beady little eyes off Forrest. Was it Forrest? It had to be, didn't it? After tugging its fellow big cat, the alley was cleared of wild animals. The only other living thing remaining was a very naked Forrest Cooper. Holy fucking hell. That was not the body of a professor. That ass could crack a whole bowl of walnuts. His back was made of powerful muscles, all coiled in apprehension. Cinder, he called out. If you could turn around, I need to fetch my clothes. Oh, damn. Forrest's clothes were a few feet away from her, but to get to them, he would have to give her a full frontal shot of his body. She flushed and heated at the thought of seeing the rest of his body. Sorry, she closed her eyes. Your modesty has been secured. She heard his bare feet slapping against the pavement and the soft shuffle of clothes. Come out from your epically bad hiding spot, Forrest said. Cinder opened her eyes just in time to see him sliding on his slacks. Forrest had the deep V that led into his trousers. It was topped by an impressive row of abs, sparsely dusted with soft hair. He slid on his shirt, hiding the rest of his body. Cinder swallowed hard as her fear and lust mixed inside of her like a weird tornado. She didn't know what to feel, Happy that Forrest had been there to fend off the attack. Horny for the man who was quickly getting dressed. Scared, because she had just been attacked. Confused, because her sexy professor was a shifter. So, she said with a faint voice as she walked toward him on shaking legs. It appears that you are a shifter. Forrest nodded. You know about shifters? Both of my sisters are mated to shifters. Right. Well, this isn't exactly a common occurrence. Humans aren't exactly supposed to know that we exist, which reveals something crucial about what just happened here. I don't know who you pissed off, but those two lions were sent to kill you. Cinder blinked up at him. Her shaking legs were turning to watery jello. Wh why? Forrest reached out and held her close to him, just as she was about to fall down onto the ground. Easy now, he cooed, holding her. You've had a bit of a shock. I'm taking you home. She wanted to ask for more details, but she couldn't form any words or coherent thoughts. Who in the hell was trying to kill her?
It took Cinder way too long to realize that Forrest wasn't bringing her to her home. It should have become obvious the second he hailed a cab. But she was nuzzled into his side, focusing on his beating heart to keep herself grounded in the moment. She didn't want to pass out, and she didn't want to appear weak. But there was nothing for it. She was shaken, cold, terrified, and so damn confused. The only thing she could truly think was that the dumpster stench had stuck to her hair. Every time she moved, she got a whiff of it, and it made her stomach roll. Here we are, Forrest announced not too long later. He helped her out of the cab and all but carried her up the steps of his brownstone. With one hand, Forrest unlocked the front door and nudged her inside. He locked the door behind him and activated a security alarm as he grabbed his phone from his coat pocket. I've just been attacked by some lions, he said into the phone by way of answer. Cinder didn't know who was on the line, but it was someone Forrest respected. He listened intently, nodding along to the information he was getting. Right, he said. I wasn't alone. The woman I was accompanying home was most likely the target. He rolled his eyes. Not the time, Fiona. Another pause. Yes, I know. This time, when he rolled his eyes, she was concerned they would get stuck in the back of his head. Not the time. I've got to tend to her. With a sigh, he hung up the phone. Come. He didn't wait to see if she had followed behind him when he walked up the staircase. We'll get you out of those clothes, and then I'll give you a bit of whiskey to get over the shock. Cinder slowly took it one stair at a time, soaking in her surroundings. This morning, she had been ready to hate Professor Forrest Cooper forever, no matter how hot he was. Now, he had saved her life from two lions and brought her to his home. What the hell was happening in her life? Forrest, she whispered, what is happening? He turned toward her, giving her a sad smile. I'm not sure, honey, but we'll figure it out. But first, we need to get you cleaned up. He disappeared through a door, and soon, the sound of a bath being drawn reached her ears. She entered the bathroom, her legs still unsteady. Have a good soak in here. I will check on you in a bit. I'll just grab a quick shower and change. There are towels there, and I'll leave some clothes by the door. They will be too big, seeing as I don't have any women's clothing, but it's better than nothing. Forrest dropped a large, warm, strong hand on her shoulder and gave it a good squeeze. His hazel eyes were swimming with all kinds of emotions. You are safe here, Cinder. I won't let anything bad happen to you, okay? She swallowed. Okay, she repeated. Forrest closed the door behind him, and she listened to his receding footsteps. Cinder peeled off her clothing, balling it all up before submerging herself in the enormous clawfoot bathtub. The water was a hot hug, wrapping her in a bone-warming embrace. She laid her head back against the headrest and blew out a breath. She was in a strange man's home after being attacked. This was totally normal. She was naked in her professor's home. That was also super fucking normal. Cinder slid her body down until her head was underwater. She held her breath for a long time, letting the bath wash away her tears. She didn't want to cry. That was just silly, but she couldn't help it. If Forrest hadn't walked her home, there was no telling what could have happened. She could have died, and that would have been the end of her life. And what did she have to show for it? A booming social media channel with millions of followers? That meant nothing in the grand scheme of things. It was a job. Only her parents and sisters would mourn her death. Cinder knew it wasn't enough. Her life wasn't enough. When she was lying on the dirty pavement, watching the wild beasts battle for the upper ground, one thing had become clear in her mind. She was focusing on the wrong dream. Oh, she still wanted to run and operate a makeup line that was sustainable and cruelty-free. But she also wanted more. She wanted a family of her own, a good man, a few kids, something that she could build with a partner, a man who loved her with everything he had. 
something that meant more than a career ever could. Cinder slowly got out of the tub, her mind reeling. How could this be her great big revelation? She had money, a good job she loved. You are lonely, her subconscious piped up. Millions of people love your persona, but in real life, you are all alone. With a sniffle, Cinder wrapped herself in a soft plush towel and let the tears fall. It was true. She was lonely. Chapter 8 Forrest Forrest didn't know he had a heart until he heard it, the soft sobs coming from the bathroom. He laid a palm against the wooden door, willing it to open so that he could take Cinder in his arms and wash away all of her tears. He had never before been attacked by other shifters, but he wasn't shaken up. Not for himself, anyway. His concern was for Cinder, his mate. Now that he had stepped forward and defended her from her enemies, it would be impossible to let her go. She wouldn't be able to return to her own home, not until they got to the bottom of this. His shifter senses wouldn't let him leave her sight. She wasn't safe out there in the big wide world. Cinder, he called out softly. I've left some clothes by the door. Take your time. I'll be downstairs in the kitchen. Join me when you feel up to it. Okay, came her watery response. He raced down the stairs and immediately began boiling vegetable broth in a large saucepan. He chopped onions, peppers, carrots, and a few other things before dumping them into the simmering broth. Next, he measured in a few noodles. He added salt, but only to make sure Cinder was thirsty. She needed plenty of water if she was going to get over the shock she had. Forrest took out rolls from the freezer and popped them into the oven to warm. By the time Cinder came down the stairs, the soup was ready, the buns were hot, and whiskey had been decanted into a small glass goblet. Her green eyes were red and puffy. She'd been up there crying all alone. Forrest knew it was clumsy of him to have left her alone with her emotions like that, but they were relative strangers. Perhaps she wouldn't have appreciated his intrusion into her tears. He had done the next best thing, cooked her a filling and fortifying meal. Come, he said, leading her to the dining room. The space was perhaps too formal for the conversation they needed to have, but at least at the large table, Forrest could sit in front of her to gauge her reactions. Cinder brought a spoonful of soup to her mouth and gulped it down. Wow, this is really good. She closed her eyes, taking another bite. Thank you for everything. It's my pleasure. Really, I'm just glad I was there. That makes two of us. Cinder, he began, just as she said. So you're a jaguar, he chuckled softly. She didn't need any of the preambles. She jumped right in. Yes, that's right. I'm a jaguar shifter, like the rest of my family. And I'm guessing the lions aren't your enemies? He shook his head. No, they are not. Earlier, I called my sister to confirm. We have no qualms with the lion shifter family in the city or the one near our lake house. That means the lions were after me. She ripped into a roll, the poor baked good bearing the brunt of her aggression. It appears that way, yes. Do you have any idea who could be behind it? Honestly? No, not really. I mean, there is this one company, Heston Cosmetics. They've been on my case for months now. They want to buy my formulas and patent them without me. Forrest frowned, growling low. They want to buy your intellectual property? She nodded. Yep, and they want me to sign an NDA so that I can't sue them for more money later on. That doesn't sound like a fair business deal. Because it's not. They keep sending this woman Magenta Heston. She pops up every now and again to try and pressure me into selling my recipes. Forrest leaned forward in his chair, pulled in by this compelling motive. And when was the last time she was in contact with you? I saw her yesterday morning. She was a bit more forceful with me. Meaning, he pressed. 
She sort of threatened me, but I mean, she can't be a shifter, can she? Forrest took a deep breath. This wouldn't be a pleasant conversation. You were wearing a pretty decent disguise today. I bet even your own mother would have had a hard time identifying you with different hair color and eyes. Shifters have a heightened sense of smell. They wouldn't need to know your appearance to track you down. All they need is your smell. Cinder's eyes went wide with shock and fear. So you think Magenta Heston is a shifter? Forrest shook his head. I'm not saying that. I have no way of knowing if this woman is a lioness or not. But I think it's safe to assume that the Hestons have shifters at their disposal. Unless there is another company vying for your secrets. Cinder pushed away her bowl of soup. I don't think so. The man that runs Allure, the only other company willing to work with me, is the man who told me I needed a degree to work for him. I doubt he sent shifters after me. He hummed out his uncertainty. Maybe the degree condition is something he put in place until he could find a way to get the formulas from you, perhaps by lion's strength. It could be a ploy to buy more time. I don't think he's behind that. He's a grouchy old man who doesn't understand makeup at all. If only he would retire, then I could deal with his granddaughter. Then all of this would be a moot point, because I wouldn't just be this one person against the cosmetic industry. I would be under the Allure umbrella. I don't know many people who would want to go mess with such a large company. I suppose, but they have to be on the list of suspects. Do you think I should call the police? God, no, don't do that. The authorities do the best they can with human crimes, but this is shifter business. Someone isn't playing fair, sending two shifters after a mere human. A mere human? Gee, thanks. I didn't mean it that way, honey. You've got to understand something. Shifters get protective, extremely so when they are faced with a foe. The sweet scent drifting off of Cinder changed sharply. He sniffed at the air, trying to decipher what it was, but he had no idea. It was something akin to desire, but there was also another part of it he had never smelled before. It's because I'm your mate, isn't it? Then, Forrest was sure he had a heart, because it clenched before stopping short. Across the dining room table, Cinder watched him carefully. One eyebrow was arched in a question, while her lips were pulled tight into a frown. The edges of her eyes pulled inward as she slowly narrowed her eyes at him. She was trying to suss out his reaction to gauge if she was right. She was. Of course she was right. But that didn't explain how she could have guessed something so strange. Most humans didn't even know shifters existed. Yet here Cinder was, hours after facing down a shifter threat, claiming that she knew she was his mate. She is smart. I told you she was for us. Do you believe me now? Forrest stood and paced the length of the dining room. Cinder remained quiet. It would have been easier if she had started throwing questions at him, but she continued watching him. Finally, he pulled the chair beside her and sat down. He blew out a breath, throwing his hands up in defeat. How did you guess? I told you, both of my sisters are mated to shifters, the way you were talking just then, about being protective, that's how Kai and Dash talk about my sisters. It wasn't that much of a long shot. He nodded. Do you understand what mates are? It was her turn to nod. Soulmates. He cracked a small, sad smile. Yes, I suppose you could compare it to soulmates, though I would argue that the bond is infinitely more crucial than that. He closed his mouth before he said any more that would scare her away. He needed her to feel safe in his home because she wasn't leaving, whether she liked it or not. Before we get into the mate thing, we need to figure out who is after you and how to stop it. I could call my sisters and get my brothers-in-law to help me find a solution. Why the fuck would you do that? She balked at his sudden harshness. Well, they are family. You don't have to deal with any of this. None of this is your problem. I assure you, it is my problem. You are my mate. And though you have sisters who are mated, 
I don't think you fully comprehend the implications. You aren't leaving this house. So much for being a cool, calm, and collected professor. Though, if he was being honest, he wasn't known for his patient demeanor. This wouldn't help with his mood and general disposition. What do you mean? You can't keep me here. I sure can. What do you intend on doing? Going back to your apartment, a lamb to the slaughter? I live in a fancy building. There are doormen and security guards. I'd be safe. Like hell you would be. You have no idea who is a shifter and who could be in league with your attackers. Neither do you. But I do, he argued. I can sniff another shifter from a mile away. You're staying here. Because I'm your mate, she crossed her arms. What if I was just some woman off the street? Well, you're my student. That means I do have a moral obligation to keep you safe. Right. I'm your student. That means I can't be your mate, right? It doesn't work like that. Shifter rules supersede human laws. Couldn't you get fired if your boss, John, learned that a student was being kept in your place against her will? She crossed her arms, staring him down. Why are you making this more complicated? All we need to focus on right now is discovering who is after you. We can deal with the mate stuff later. Not fucking happening, his jaguar roared. He ignored the thought. One problem at a time was enough for him. Cinder blew out a breath. Shit, you are right. I'm sorry, I'm just confused and overwhelmed right now. I started the day with a math class. Now I am being chased by shifters, and I've got myself a shifter mate. My life just got a hell of a lot more complicated. He reached out to take her hand in his. He wove their fingers together. I understand this is all very complex, so let's come to an agreement for now. You are in danger. We figure out who is after you and remove the threat. Then, once that is all settled, we will deal with the mate stuff. She licked her lips. Because I'm your student. Exactly. We don't have to fix everything right now. There is a more pressing matter. That's your safety. Okay. Okay? He repeated. Not okay. His jaguar roared. You can't expect to live under the same roof as your mate and not do something about it. You'll drive us insane with desire. Do you not smell that? She's into you though I don't know why, since you're basically pushing her away. Forrest disagreed with his beast. He wasn't pushing her away, but he also wouldn't be pushing her to decide what she wanted to do about the whole mate thing. Not on the same day that she had been attacked. Not on the same day that she had learned her professor was her mate. That was too much. Hell, it was even too much for him, and he tried to solve impossible math as a hobby. One thing at a time. When Cinder was safe, then he would wine and dine her. He would convince her, and himself, that this could work. After all, the fact that she was his student was the least of their worries. He had a decade on her. She was a fan of social media and a whole world he didn't understand. Nor did he feel particularly inclined to learn. Destiny might have sent him his mate in the most obvious way, but it wasn't obvious at all why Cinder was chosen for him. For a genius, you sure are dumb, his jaguar mumbled. Chapter 9 Cinder I am at my professor's house. I am wearing his pajamas, laying down in his guest bedroom. This was completely normal. Every woman found herself in this situation at one point or another, right? Wrong. So fucking wrong. After clearing away the kitchen in silence, Forrest retreated to his study to do some work. Cinder tried to follow behind him, wanting to help him solve the mystery of her attack. But he sent her to the living room to watch television. When she argued with him, the man gave her homework. Actual, real-life homework. They'd shared a takeout Greek dinner before Forrest returned to his study. Cinder finished all of the math problems before falling asleep on the couch, watching old black and white movies. 
Sometime after midnight, Forrest found her in the living room. Why didn't you go up to bed? He chided. Sleepy and groggy, she sat up. Because I don't know which bedroom I can use. He blushed and hissed out a curse word. I'm so sorry, honey. I forgot to show you to the guest room. I'm not used to being a host, and I've been busy figuring out- He stopped, short. Yes, she pressed, desperate to know if he had learned anything about her case. I've been trying to figure out how to solve P versus NP. She rolled her eyes. You're a bad liar. He took her hand in his and led her up two floors, down the hall to the right to the guest bedroom. It was a large space with an enormous canopy bed covered by a white, soft plush comforter. I hope it's comfortable. I've never used this room. I'm across the hall, two doors down if you need anything. But you should know, the security alarm is active, and I've got shifter hearing. It'll take quite a bit to sneak up on me. You're safe. If you say so. Cinder closed the door behind her and jumped onto the bed, tired down to the bone. She'd done very little that day, but no matter how much sleep she caught, it was always fitful and ended in a pretty serious nightmare where the lions ripped up forest before turning their teeth on her. In the most luxurious bed she had ever laid on, sleep should have been easy enough to get. It wasn't. She tossed and turned. It was one thing to fall asleep on her professor's couch, but this? It was a guest bedroom in his house. It felt impossibly more intimate. Though he said he never used the bed, Cinder swore she could smell his musk on the pillow. With a sigh, she turned to face the window. The moon streamed in with shining light. She could always call her sisters. The second Amber and Sparks knew that she was in shifter trouble, they would want to get involved. They would send Kai and Dash over, and then the house would be overrun with grumpy shifters and hovering sisters. It was too late in the night to call them anyway. Maybe in the morning, she would call them and ask them how they dealt with a shifter mate. Maybe they could give her some tips. She didn't know where to go from here. So the sexy, grumpy professor was her mate. They'd agreed to put that on pause while they uncovered who was after her. Cinder didn't miss the way Forrest had kept her out of the study and away from whatever investigation he was doing. Cinder made a decision. As soon as she woke up, she would march herself downstairs and demand that Forrest include her in whatever plan he was concocting to uncover her attackers. Resolved and feeling a bit more settled, Cinder fell asleep. She dreamed of a certain professor, naked and virile. Cinder jumped up in bed, confused and ready to strike. Her hands were balled into fists as she struggled to get her legs free from the blanket. It took her a few seconds to remember where she was and why she was there. The attack, a very naked forest, his guest bedroom. The mouth-watering scent of pancakes permeated the air. It mixed in with the smell of strong coffee. Cinder's stomach growled loudly, desperate to devour whatever was causing the wonderful aroma. Wearing the pajama pants and sweatshirt Forrest had given her, Cinder made her way down to the kitchen. Forrest's back was to her as he flipped pancakes in a large pan. Morning, he said, with no trace of sleep in his voice. Hey. There's fresh coffee in the pot. I've set out a mug for you. Cream and sugar are right here. There's also orange juice and milk. Let me know if you need anything else. Cinder poured herself a cup of coffee and immediately gulped down half the cup. She refilled her mug before going to stand next to Forrest. Do you always make pancakes in the morning? He chuckled. I don't, but I figured I best bring my A-game. Are you trying to impress me, Forrest? She asked, forgetting that she wasn't supposed to flirt with him. Not so much impress as feed you. Is this your way of making sure I don't leave then, by plying me with good food? If it works, it works, he laughed. Cinder hadn't known Forrest long, but she had a feeling that he didn't laugh easily. The sound of it was beautiful and warm, but there was almost an unused quality to it like he was surprised he even knew how to laugh anymore. 
Is there anything I can do to help? No, you just sit down and enjoy your coffee. She did just that, staring down into her cup. So I've been thinking about something. Why do I feel like that could be dangerous? Hush. So yesterday, you were locked in your study, trying to figure out who is after me, right? And you gave me space and time to recuperate from the attack, and from learning that I'm a shifter's mate. I appreciate it. I'm also grateful that you're letting me stay here. I don't exactly want to be turned into lion chow, but I need to know what you found out. I have to be involved in the fix. I can't let you deal with this all by yourself while I play the damsel in distress. Forrest turned off the stove and turned to face her. You are not playing at the damsel in distress. You very much are in a lot of trouble. She rolled her eyes. Right, I know that, but I want to figure this out for myself. Not going to happen, honey. I discovered that the Hestons are indeed shifters. Lions, to be precise. Now, that would be bad enough, but we would have our culprits if they were the only lion shifters involved. As it turns out, Allure's CEO employs a security company ran by a shifter. There are lions, tigers, bears, she added for a bit of comic relief. Bears, sure. So you're basically telling me that the company who wants to take my formulas and the company that I'm hoping to work with both have ties to lion shifters? Yes. This won't be an easy fix then. I don't think so, no. Well, that sucks balls. What am I supposed to do? I could call Mr. Allure of the retirement home and arrange a meeting. You could come with me and suss out if it's the same shifters using that nose of yours. That's not a bad idea, but it's not happening. Why not? Because you'd have to leave the house, and that isn't happening. You can't be serious. How are we supposed to figure out who is after me if I can't leave? The best way to go about this is to use me as bait. Forrest didn't like that. He all but leapt over the counter to frame her into her chair. Do not, under any circumstances, say that. You are not bait, Cinder. You are not putting yourself in danger for some makeup. She bristled. Forrest's face was inches from hers. She could count the freckles along the bridge of his nose and trace his hairline with the tip of her fingers if she only reached out. His crisp, woodsy scent was intoxicating, almost as much as having his face right there. His lips right there. She could kiss him by moving a fraction of an inch closer. Cinder licked her lips, desperate to get a taste of his kiss. She was positive it would be the best damn kiss of her life. Banishing all thoughts of lions and shifters and makeup empires, Cinder leaned into Forrest's body, craning her head to place her lips against his in a soft press. She had only meant for the softest of touches, but the second their lips met, Forrest groaned. The sound was pained and tortured. Without any warning, he cupped her face in his hands and angled her head to take control of the kiss. His tongue traced the seam of her mouth before gaining entry. He explored her mouth, gently sucking on her tongue. Cinder let him. Her hands clutched his t-shirt as she craved more contact. She moaned into the embrace, wanting so much more than these maddening kisses. We need to stop, Forrest panted, pulling away from her. His breathing was labored, and there was a definite bulge in his pants that hadn't been there moments ago. The man wanted her just as much as she wanted him. But it couldn't happen. She was his student. This was crossing some kind of weird line. You're right, she whispered. Sorry, I just, you made me pancakes. He arched a brow at her. I made you pancakes so you kiss me? It was a sweet gesture. You did it to placate me, and I won't forget it. But do you think we could eat those pancakes before they get cold? He chuckled. Sure thing, honey. Forrest served up two plates of pancakes loaded down with syrup, fresh fruit, and whipped cream. Here you go. This is the second time you fed me something homemade. I'm spoiled, he shrugged. 
I'm not typically in the habit of cooking such elaborate meals, seeing as I live alone. But when my family gets together, I'm the one who cooks. Do you have a large family? Your sister and her kids? Is that everyone? It sure is. Fiona and Eduardo have two kids, Lucia and Antonio. They're the cutest little kids around. Antonio will probably be a jaguar like his mother, but Lucia seems to take more after her father. We'll have to wait and see. What do you mean? The first shift happens around puberty. We won't know which animal the kids will be until then. Oh, that is fascinating. If you have kids, would they be jaguars? Definitely. Both of my parents are jaguar shifters. They met when they were kids and immediately knew they were destined for each other. They studied the animal kingdom together all over the world. They only settled in the city when Fiona was school-aged. Is she older then? Forrest pushed away his plate, having polished off all of his food. No, she's a few years younger. My first years of education were done by my parents. Cinder giggled. Think maybe that is why you were a boy genius? Because your parent knew how to challenge you? Probably. That's why Fiona and Eduardo are homeschooling the kids. They're hoping that the children take after me. She threw her balled up napkin at him. I am sure your sister is just as intelligent as you. Perhaps, he teased. Can I ask you something? Of course. Why did you pick math? If your entire family are in the zoology field, why deviate? Forrest considered the question. Numbers make sense to me. They always behave the same way. A one is always a one. A multiplication is always a multiplication. Animals are unpredictable, just like humans. You like order and patterns, then? Yes, exactly. Do you think perhaps that's the same thing that draws you into making your own products? Cinder picked at a pancake. I think so. I'm not sure, actually. I like being in my kitchen, mixing the ingredients, knowing that they are all organic and safe. When I started my makeup tutorial videos, I was really young. I didn't think to look at the ingredients on the stuff I was using. But then, as I grew up, I looked into it. Animal fat, chemicals I couldn't even pronounce. Then a fellow social media influencer got really sick. She was a few years older than me, but she got skin cancer. The doctors figured it was because she was always covering every inch of her skin with chemicals. Cinder blinked back tears, thinking of Sonia. We'll never know for sure, but when she died, I... She swallowed hard. I felt responsible for my millions of followers. All of a sudden, it wasn't just lipstick I was putting on my face. It was a potentially dangerous thing full of harmful chemicals. I have a duty, don't I, to only promote products that I would use that I deem safe? Forrest looked at her, his eyes full of emotions she couldn't figure out. There was confusion drawn in the pucker of his brows. There was concern pulling at the corner of his delicious mouth. There was something else. It felt like admiration. But that wasn't right, was it? That's why you want to protect your formulas, you want to make sure they remain chemical and cruelty-free. Exactly. I know that the Hestons will cut corners. They will label it safe, but it won't be. If you saw the regulations that cosmetic companies can get away with, you'd be shocked. But now that I know, I can't ignore it. I want there to be an affordable and mainstream line of makeup out there that doesn't hurt any living thing. It's commendable what you're doing. Hardly. It took someone dying for me to realize it. Maybe. But your friend was older. She made her own decision. That's just the thing. If you see your favorite actress or video blogger wearing makeup, you assume it's safe, right? I think that big corporations like the Hestons and even Allure take advantage of that to a certain degree. The deal I am trying to get with Allure would protect my viewers and anyone who decided to buy my products. I would use Allure's company's umbrella, but I would be in charge of the cosmetic line with my name on it. That way, I'm positive that I am promoting and representing a safe product. And Allure is making you get a degree before they consider doing business with you? That's an interesting play. Right? It does feel underhanded somehow. 
I mean, an old white guy telling me to get an education before he even considers working with me? This is a man who has never worn makeup or spent a day in a lab trying to make the products. He inherited the company from his family, but he thinks he's the expert. He doesn't have any formal education. Cinder dropped her fork. Excuse me? When I was looking into the attack yesterday, I did extensive research on Matthias Carlyle. He graduated from high school and then immediately started working for his family's company. He climbed the ranks because of nepotism? Looks that way, yes. Cinder felt anger bubble inside of her. It's bullshit. He isn't even willing to let his granddaughter take the reins, even though she would be inheriting the business just like he did. It's frustrating. I'm sorry you have to face this. Just another example of the man trying to keep us down. She rolled her eyes. Whatever, this is but a bump in the road. It won't stop me from achieving my goals. Forrest smiled. You're very determined. It's a Brady family trait. We are known to be stubborn. But you know, now that you've called it determination, I like that a lot more. Stubborn has a negative connotation. Forrest agreed. Determined speaks of values and hard work. She echoed his smile. Exactly. Now, I'm determined to do the dishes since you've fed me twice already and let me crash in your guest bedroom. I'll help. We can discuss the next steps while we work. Cinder and Forrest had only just met, and not in the best of ways even. But clearing the kitchen table and doing the dishes with him was comfortable and familiar. It felt like they'd done it millions of times before. Cinder appreciated every time he brushed up against her. She even went out of her way to be in his way. She couldn't help herself. They might have agreed to keep the mate stuff aside, but now that she had kissed him, she wanted more. She just had to find a way to get it done. And she would. She wasn't stubborn. She was determined. Chapter 10 Forest. Having his mate in his space was the most painful joy Forrest had ever felt. After cleaning up breakfast, he announced he needed to do something. He was desperate to cut the edge off. The kiss they'd shared still tingled his lips. It had been a foolish thing to give in to his need for Cinder, but he couldn't help himself. If she stayed with him much longer, his resolve would melt like butter in a hot pan. The sooner they figured out who was after Cinder, the quicker he could take her back to her place and away from him. You're fighting a losing battle. I say that by the end of the day, you've made it her. As always, his jaguar was absolutely ridiculous. There was no way he could mate a woman he'd just met, one who was his student and, well, weren't those reasons enough to stay away from her? He had to make tenure, and she was his way into that. Besides, he was ten years older than her, and though she was a strong and intelligent woman, that was quite the age gap. Not to mention her addiction to social media. She had built her entire career on it. It was something he didn't understand, nor did he care to. Forrest retreated down to the basement, which he had turned into a state-of-the-art gym. He couldn't exactly go to the campus gym, how was he supposed to explain to 20-year-olds why their nearly 40-year-old professor could bench press upwards of 500 pounds? There was no way. He'd constructed the gym to work out in peace, especially when he didn't have the time to get away to the lake house for a jaunt through the woods as a jaguar. He made sure Cinder could make herself at home before retreating downstairs. He burned off the edge of his desire for Cinder by doing weights, running for miles on the treadmill, and he even pulled out the big guns, the rowing machine. It wasn't his favorite exercise, and by the time he was done, the machine groaned in pain from his forcefulness. And still, he wanted Cinder. It was impossible. How could one single kiss linger after nearly three hours? Forrest did the only remaining thing he could think of. He jumped into the shower and stroked himself to orgasm, 
all the while imagining what it would be like to kiss and lick and nip every inch of Cinder's body. By the time he was done, four hours had passed. He called out for his mate, but received no answer. Her scent was everywhere in his house, and it would probably linger for days, if not weeks. That would be almost as intoxicating as the woman herself. He found Cinder in the kitchen. The island was covered in bowls and many implements that made his kitchen more like a mad scientist's laboratory. Cinder's brown hair was piled in a messy bun on top of her head, and she had taken a pair of scissors to his t-shirt to make it smaller, and she had pinned the back of it somehow. It exposed the soft skin of her hips, making his mouth water, despite the rub and tug he'd just given himself. What's happening here? I got bored, so I ordered a bunch of stuff to keep busy. Don't worry, none of the ingredients you see are from your food stock. You ordered groceries? Cinder blushed. In a manner of speaking, I ordered ingredients to make makeup. You were gone for so long and I was going crazy. At least this way I'm being practical and doing something. Forrest crossed his arms. And just how did you pay for this order? She frowned. Well, my credit card. What else would I use? Did you not think that perhaps whoever is after you could decide to track your credit cards? She blanched, dropping a spatula coated with a thick strawberry-scented substance onto the counter. You think they can do that? Of course. If they are shifters, there is no telling what they are capable of. Are you telling me that I did a dumb thing? That I just put a target on your house? Her eyes swam with tears, and she wrung her hands together. I didn't think of that. I'm sorry. I can go. I just got so bored. I'm going to ruin your life if I stay here. Stop. He closed the distance between them. Was this the smartest thing you've ever done? No, but it's okay. We'll manage if they come to the door. They shouldn't. This is a pretty swanky neighborhood, and they would smell that I'm a shifter. This is hardly the place for a showdown. It would risk exposure. But now they know where I am. She hadn't framed it as a question. Probably. Cinder covered her face with her hands. Shit, I suck at the subterfuge thing. Where were you anyway? You've been gone all day. Jim in the basement. I didn't realize I was gone so long. Right, I guess it makes sense. No professor has a body like yours, unless they're also pulling hours at the gym. His interest flared. Cinder liked what she saw in him. Of course she does. She's our mate. Really, there's only so many times I can tell you this before I lose my patience. Forrest, you're not going to like the other thing I did. Not after this whole debacle. He stiffened, leaning on the counter as he waited for her to go on. I sort of called the dean, John Kramer, and I told him I had to drop out of the deal we had. What? He snapped. Do you have any idea what you've done? Not only will I have to get some friends of mine to do security on this place, but now you've jeopardized my career? Excuse me? She crossed her arms. How did I jeopardize your career? Forrest ran a hand through his hair. You can't just call the dean of mathematics and tell him you're dropping out. Sure I can. I already did it. I told him I would have to wait until next semester to start the courses because of a family emergency. I can't focus on learning math and placating a grouchy old man while there are shifters after me. My current circumstances aren't exactly conducive to learning. Forrest was flooded with relief, but still angry that she had done all of this in the short time he had been in the gym. Christ, the woman had done a lot during a single workout. You're a jackass. You've been gone all morning. What did you think she would do? Sit still and pretty while she waited for you? He ignored the jaguar. Anything else you've done to make our lives more complicated? Hey, jerk face. I ordered ingredients to not steal all of your food, and then I called your boss so that you would stop beating yourself up about the whole mated to a student thing. If you are done being an ass, maybe we could talk about this like grown adults instead of flinging shit at each other. Forrest blinked at her. You called John because you are my mate? She crossed her arms. Well, that was only part of it. 
I am not in the mood to be learning complex equations that have nothing to do with my recipes and running a business. The fact that you would chill with the brooding was an added bonus. I do not brood. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. She spoke the words at the same time as his animal. They were ganging up on him. How was that fair? Cinder, you being a student wasn't the only reason why we need to stay away from each other. You are much younger than me. She blew out a frustrated breath. Are all shifters so annoyingly indecisive? Kai fought the mate sense with Ember. Dash did the same with Sparks. Is this a thing you all do? You learn who your soulmate is and then rage because it's not convenient? Guess what? Love is never convenient. Do you know how lucky you are that you just know without a doubt who is meant for you? Do you know how much pain and heartache you have avoided? My sisters and I have been cheated on, mistreated, broken up with because of our ambitions. And when we finally find our guys, we have to convince you that it is okay to be together? Forrest opened his mouth to reply, but he had no words. He was stunned, and Cinder wasn't done. It's fucked up. So fucked up that you have this huge advantage, but you basically complain that you're too blessed. Typical fucking male. If I had a mate sense, or whatever it is you call it, I wouldn't waste it on silly shit like professor-student relationships or age differences. Newsflash, Forrest, we aren't typical people. You are a genius who started college in your teens, and I am an entrepreneur who has been working since I was a preteen while doing my GED on a fast track. What is ten years among two people who have always broken the mold? From where I am standing, you are a shifter fighting his own instincts for bad reasons. So either get over yourself or let me go home. If this, she motioned between them, isn't what you want, then let me go. But you don't get to play the aggressively protective mate if we won't take it further. If we won't take this to the natural progression. Once again, he opened his mouth to reply, but no thought was formed in his head. Was his mate giving him a good dressing down? She sure was. And she was right on all fronts. So why wasn't he holding her close? Why wasn't he making love to her mouth while peeling her clothes off her? Why didn't he place her on the counter to devour her pussy? He was terrified. For the first time in his life, Forrest Cooper knew what fear was. He did trust his mate sense, but it was still nerve-wracking to let in this woman who was being pursued by an unknown enemy. What if he couldn't protect her? What if he failed her? What if his grumpy, or as Cinder had put it, his brooding nature made them a bad bet? If they were mated and she got sick of his shit, she could walk away, leaving him in pain. It was still a considerable risk, and Forrest didn't do risks. He lived his life by the rules like it was one big mathematical equation. Cinder was shaking up the rules. One was no longer one. She'd been in his life for a matter of hours, and she had turned his life upside down. One meant two, meant three, meant risk. Are you going to say something, or shall I keep going? Because I still have a lot of shit to say. Forrest reached out, cupped her cheeks in his hands, and took a deep breath of her lovely, intoxicating scent. Let my brain catch up. I'm good with numbers, not so much with words. I'll keep going then. There was a teasing glint in her eyes, and she stepped out of his embrace. Kai and Dash tried to resist their connection with my sisters, you know what that got them? He shook his head. It got them nothing, because in the end, they're meant to be together. You've got a choice here, Forrest. Either you lean into the fact that you're a shifter, or you forget all about it, about me. Cinder took a step closer to him, placing her hands against his beating heart. I shouldn't have to convince you to take what is yours. She patted his pecs and turned on her heels. With her back turned to him, she threw her shirt off. The damn woman wasn't wearing a bra. Her smooth back was bare, the edge of her breasts peeking from her sides. She coyly turned her head to look at him over her shoulder. I'll be upstairs. It's up to you, Forrest Cooper. He watched her go, his jaw 
somewhere on the ground. Chapter 11 Cinder Holy fucking fuckballs, or something like that. Cinder slowly made her way up the stairs, knowing Forrest was watching her. She could feel his eyes on her. It burned her skin in the most delicious way. She only hoped that her gambit would pay off. Forrest had disappeared to his basement for so long. After the second hour, Cinder had begun to wonder just what the hell he was doing. Judging by the grunts, Forrest was either working out or jerking off. Since he was down there for over four hours, she had to figure it was working out. A four-hour jerk session would result in some serious chafing. After hour two, Cinder called her sisters. They hadn't done a conference call in a long time, but this situation warranted it. She asked them about grumpy mates who fight the mate sense, giving her sisters no information about the attack and the threat hanging over her head. Ember and Sparks had said the same thing. Do not back down. Apparently, being mated to a shifter is wonderful. If Cinder was lucky enough to be a shifter's mate, she should fight for it. Dash was a pain in the ass on the mountain. He didn't want to start anything with me because he didn't want to stand in my way. Male shifters are great, but sometimes their sense of honor is a little inflated. It gets in their own way. You mean self-important, she corrected Sparks. Sure, if that helps you. I had to be pretty bold to thaw my man, Sparks pointed out. I think you need to do the same, especially if it's that sense of honor that is holding him back. Cinder had pondered this for all of two seconds. It wasn't that big of a deal to call John Kramer to defer her class. After all, if Mr. Allure of the misogynists was behind the attack, she wouldn't want to work for him. Her time was precious, and she wouldn't waste it on taking classes that wouldn't serve her, even if the professor was buzz bank worthy. The call to John Kramer took no time at all. By the time she hung up, the local grocery store had their delivery boy sent over with everything she had needed for her concoctions. She was halfway through making a strawberry exfoliant when Forrest finally emerged from the basement, freshly showered, and looking like a model in his charcoal slacks and burgundy button-down shirt. She gave herself the goal to see him in jeans and a t-shirt before the week was through. The business wear was sexy as hell, but she wanted to see Forrest dressed down and chilling the fuck out. It had taken nearly all of her courage to have that conversation with him in his kitchen. Her ego was a bit bruised by it, if she was honest, a man who was basically made for her, just like she was made for him, was fighting the attraction between them, with no good reason. It made no sense to her. The stripping was meant to shock Forrest into action, just like Sparks had done for her guy. If he rejected her now, if he chose to continue to ignore the whole mate thing, her bruised ego would move into a new, fresh kind of pain. But Cinder had something on her side. Faith. She had faith in life and in love. She was always the optimistic sister, the one who could see on the bright side. Now, she had laid it all out on the line. She had just thrown an open invitation for sex with a man she barely knew, because she had faith that Forrest's senses were right about them. They were meant to be together, if anything. The kiss they had shared was proof enough that together, they could burn some holes in some sheets. A single kiss had never made her wet before, but she had to change her underwear once Forrest was done with her. The man knew how to kiss. No, her man knew how to kiss. Get with the program, Forrest Cooper, or I will take care of myself and moan so loud your neighbors will be able to hear me. Cinder bypassed her bedroom and went straight for the master suite at the end of the hall. The room was massive, with a California king-sized bed in the middle of the room. The headboard was an elaborate slate of wood, decorated with a leaping jaguar. How fitting, really. The colors ranged from deep forest green to warm burgundy. The colors went well with the blonde god who lived here. Cinder laid down on the bed, the soft green comforter brushing against her naked skin. 
Never before had she laid naked in bed, waiting for a man. It was a new sort of vulnerability that made her heart beat way too fast in her chest. The creak of the stairs made her breath catch, and she held it until Forrest leaned against the doorframe. He crossed his arms as his hungry eyes took in her naked body. His looks were scorching as he perused her like one of his beloved math problems. He was trying to decide where to start, she was sure of it. She could feel the strong pull between them. He was going to take her. Her pussy clenched, beckoning him closer. We need to make something very clear right now, Cinder. If we fuck, this is it. We are mates. There is no going back, and there is no changing your mind. I'll be yours, and you'll be mine. She gave him a sly smile. I'm sorry, was I not clear enough? Isn't that basically what I said? His eyes flashed with heat as he took long but slow steps toward the bed. Cinder licked her lips, not knowing what he would do. The only conviction she had was that it would be good. So fucking good. No man could look at a woman like she made the world go round and not rock her world. At the edge of the bed, Forrest grabbed hold of her ankle and dragged her down the bed until her legs dangled off the sides. His hands traveled up her calves to her thighs. He pinned the bent limbs into the bed, his eyes riveted on her moistened pussy before flicking up to meet her gaze. She swallowed, her breath shallow and hurried, what the hell is he going to do? Please, do something. Touch me, kiss me, fuck me, I beg of you. Cinder nodded in case he needed her permission to go any further. That did the trick. Forrest dropped to his knees and buried his head between her legs. He dropped an open mouth kiss to her lips, his tongue peeking between the lips in a teasing dance. He avoided her clit, touched everywhere but where she wanted him the most. It was pure torture, but fuck did it feel good. Forrest growled his appreciation before lapping at her juices, bottom to top. His lick ended at her clit. This time, he flicked it. His tongue flattened against the hard nub before he suckled it into his mouth. Her hips bowed off the bed, her hands going to his thick hair to keep him locked in exactly where he was. He wasn't going anywhere until she came all over his tongue. She wouldn't let him. Forrest, she cried out when he nipped at her clit. His chuckle added pleasure to the moment. That's right, he cooed, dipping a single finger inside of her. God, you taste so good. I'm going to enjoy this. He added a second finger inside her, pumping slowly in and out as he continued to lap at her juices. Pleasure was coursing through her veins as he continued to toy with her body. She was made of numbers, and he was the mathematician solving the equation for her orgasm. And boy, did he know what he was doing. With his fingers buried deep inside of her and his tongue on her clit, Cinder careened toward her release, exploding into the universe with a cry of his name. He didn't relent, but continued to lap at her as if his life depended on it. And it sort of did. They were joined together as she climaxed, pulling at his hair, clenching his fingers. When the aftershocks of her orgasm subsided, Forrest stood between her mushy legs. Her breathing was just as erratic as it had been. Well she managed to say through a few pants of air. That's certainly not what I expected. You shouldn't have felt the need to convince me that this was the right thing for us. I should have been more forthcoming with my feelings toward you. And I shouldn't have snapped at you for trying to put my mind at ease about our working relationship. She giggled. Are you trying to tell me that was a reward for helping you get your head out of your ass? He grinned. I suppose you could say that. Though that was as much for me as it was for you. I've been dying to do that since I laid eyes on you in that ridiculously short skirt. Forrest, I don't understand everything about mates, so I won't pretend to. But I need you to understand something about me. When I don't know something, I find it for myself when I need the information to move forward. I called my sisters about this. I'm not going into this relationship blind. 
My two siblings have been mated for months now. I know what I'm getting into. I have no idea what I'm getting into, and that's a little terrifying. His vulnerable admission melted her heart. Cinder sat up on her knees and closed her arms around his neck, crushing her breasts into the soft material of his shirt. Well, I'm stubborn, or determined. I work hard and often. I'm passionate, and I care about my family, a lot. They're important to me. I'm a little bit eccentric, and sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night to create a banana and oatmeal leg scrub. I like to spend hours doing makeup because it's an art form for me. You're wonderful, Cinder, really. You're impressive. What you've been able to create and achieve in such a short amount of time, it's definitely an attractive quality. Say you won't fight this. I won't fight this, he agreed. Fine. Good. Then what are you waiting for? I'm fully nude, and you're standing there like you're about to teach a class. I am about to teach a class. She arched a brow and smirked. Oh? I'm about to teach you how to take as many orgasms as I can give you. Cinder rolled her eyes, but laid back down on the bed, spreading her legs wide. Promises, promises. The speed at which Forrest stripped his clothes was impressive as hell. He ripped his shirt off and kicked his pants away. His black boxer briefs clung to his muscular body, an impressive erection pushing against the material. He peeled them off before kneeling on the bed. His body was a testament to the four hours he had spent in the gym. He was all power and muscles, his tanned skin pulling taut as he moved. He was as graceful and as powerful as the jaguar that lay dormant inside of him. Forrest licked his lips before laying his body down and across hers. His lips found a sensitive spot in the crook of her neck. His tongue drew a pattern there before he nipped the tender skin with a groan. You taste delicious everywhere. His rock-hard cock was pressed into her hip, the smooth, steely skin making her dizzy with want, even though she had just had an orgasm. She wanted another, and another. Good thing he had promised multiples. Cinder was still marveling that throwing down a challenge had worked to get Forrest moving toward her. It was a damn wonder, but she wouldn't let her mind go into overdrive. She had a mate. Cinder would never have admitted this out loud to anyone, not even her sisters. But she was jealous when both of them had found shifter mates. Not the mean sort of envy, but the why can't I find someone type of jealousy that reeked of loneliness. Now she had found him, her mate, her someone, the one who would support her in her dreams, just like her brothers-in-law did for Ember and Sparks. What's happening in that brain of yours? Forrest asked, kissing her temple. I'm just happy that my stripping worked. His chuckle rumbled against her. Do you have any idea how hard it's been to keep my hands off of you since that kiss? Not hard at all? His laugh was deep this time. I don't usually work out for so long, and I definitely do not take care of business when I have house guests. Take care of business? She asked teasingly. She knew what he meant, of course. Forrest didn't answer. Instead, he dipped his head down to capture one of her nipples. He pulled it into his mouth with a deep suck. She felt down into her core. His other hand gripped her other breast, tweaking the nipple between his fingers. He shifted his hips, rubbing his cock against her smooth skin. Her hands traveled up and down his muscular back, exploring every spot that made him shiver and moan. She gripped his ass hard, leaving the half-moon imprints of her nails behind. His ass was hers. It was fucking perfect because who knew men's butts could be so delicious? It was almost as hot as the deep V in that led down to his impressive erection. Stop teasing me, Forrest. Just taking my time. I want to remember our first time for the rest of my life. I'm going insane here. I need you inside me. 
He arched a brow and grinned at her. There's that impatient determination you were talking about. She pinched his side. I've bared myself to you, Forrest Cooper. Don't you dare tease me any more than you already have. We need to discuss something first. Cinder groaned in frustration as she slid her hand between their bodies to close it around his cock. She guided the tip of it to her entrance. Still feel the need to talk right now? Forrest's eyes were burning. Protection, Cinder. We have to talk about it. Oh, well, I've got an IUD, and I'm safe. If his look was searing before, it was the same temperature as the sun just then. You want me to take you bare? If you're safe, shifters can't get STDs. Cinder's smile broadened, and she arched her hips up. The simple move had the tip of his cock sliding a fraction deeper inside of her. Forrest swallowed hard as he gripped her hips. He thrust forward, filling her with one single motion. He was big, bigger than all of her previous sexual partners. He was touching places that had never been touched before. He was stretching her out, pressing against each nerve ending. She clenched hard, desperate to feel all of it. Forrest, she moaned, digging her nails into the skin of his back. Please, move. He did. He eased out of her before slamming home again. He used his hold on her hips to send a rhythm that was neither slow nor fast. It was the perfect equation to bring her pleasure, all the while keeping her orgasm at bay. You feel so good, Cinder, bare and wet, just for me. He nipped at her neck before peppering kisses across her chest. When he closed his mouth around her nipple, she bucked off the bed, needing everything he was ready to give her. Deep inside of her, the beginnings of her orgasm sent sparks to the tips of her fingers, to the top of her head. She was about to go off. She met Forrest, thrust for thrust, crying out his name. That's it, honey. Come for me. I want to feel you squeeze my cock dry. His words, mixed with the suction against the side of her breast, sent her over the edge. Cinder's pussy clenched his cock like a vice as she rode out her pleasure, screaming incoherent things that all equated to his name. Forrest wasn't too far behind, pumping his hips with less finesse before he roared out his release. It was her name on his lips as he came deep inside of her. Once their breathing had settled, he laid them down on the bed, letting his hands draw patterns against her heated skin. That was impressive, she sighed, content and satiated. It was, he agreed before kissing her shoulder. Give me a minute, and we can go for round two. Oh, good. I was going to say, I was promised multiple orgasms, and by my count, that was only two. She gave him a devilish grin, one he swallowed with a kiss. Then, Forrest proceeded to give her multiples on top of multiples. The man was just as determined as Cinder. Chapter 12 Forest. Forrest watched as the sun was streaming in from the window, drawing a light show on his mate's bare skin. They had spent the rest of the day and most of the night wrapped up in each other. They only took breaks to eat a bit and hydrate. He had never felt so satiated, but so desperate for more at the same time. He had to cool it, though. Cinder was a human woman. Surely, any more sex and he would break her in two. It was pretty surprising that a normal woman, one with no experience with shifters, had been the one to make him realize just how silly he was being by trying to keep away from her. A shifter should never fight against the mate sense. And yet, he had tried, because he wanted to prove to himself that he wasn't the cliched professor who slept with his students. And he hadn't been all because Cinder had taken matters into her own hands. He wasn't too pleased that she had quit his class, but he also understood that the type of classes he taught had no use in running a makeup empire. Not when it was pretty clear 
that Cinder was a brilliant chemist. All of her skills were self-taught and ruled by pure instincts. That was borderline shifter behavior. It left very little doubt that his mate was indeed the woman for him. He had let his own pride nearly ruin them before they began. If it hadn't been for Cinder's bold move of stripping on her way up to his bedroom, there was no telling how the night would have gone. But he wouldn't have initiated any sex, not when Cinder was still his student, and not when she was still in danger. That was a problem they needed to fix and fast. Now that Cinder had used her credit card at his address, they couldn't stay in his home. He had taken a chance by spending the night, but he had a solution, one he knew Cinder would oppose. He was going to have to be sneaky about it to make sure his mate was safe. Cinder was obviously not the kind of woman who liked being saved. But if he had to deal with her determination, she had to deal with his protectiveness. It would serve her well, just like her determination had served him well. Already, they were interwoven in a give-and-take relationship. It would only get better from this point on. They had a lot of things to look forward to. But first, he had to get her to safety and away from the city's threat. Forrest kissed Cinder's shoulders and ran his knuckles against her cheekbone. Good morning, honey. Cinder blinked her eyes open and gave him a wide, happy smile. Morning. Did you sleep well? She giggled, nuzzling into his side. I did, once this crazed, sexy fiend left me alone. He laughed, deep and loud. I think you're misremembering the night, darling. It was you who kept begging for more. I regret nothing, she said with a happy sigh. But I definitely need a break and a shower. You hop in, and I'll start on breakfast. Then we can head out. She sat up, confused. Head out? Like out in the world? We're going up to my parents' lake house today. He hoped he was nonchalant enough so as not to get her worried or suspicious. Why are we going there? Is everything okay? It sure is. It's just a family dinner. I can't miss it. And I figure, since you're my mate, and you've insisted on not holding back, you should come with me. Also, let's not forget that there is someone out there who wants to harm you. I am not letting you out of my sight. Not until this is all fixed. Are you telling me that I am about to meet your parents? And my sister and her family, yes. Is that a problem? Nope. She jumped off the bed and raced to the bathroom. It's basically like you're stripping and laying naked on the bed for me. A little quid pro quo. I like it. Let's go meet the fam. Forrest did feel some guilt at tricking his maid away from the city and to the family's lake house. But he knew that if he had suggested it, she would have refused for fear of putting his family in danger, especially the kids. He didn't have the same fear because he knew better. The lake house was basically a fortress. There was a panic room in the basement in case of an attack stocked full of stuff for the kids. To top it all off, they were a family of shifters. His parents and sister were the top zoologists in North America. They knew how to attack and take down any animal. They would be safer altogether at the lake house, especially now that whoever was after Cinder would know where she was holed up. His parents had the lake house under an assumed name. Years ago, there had been a pack of elephants who were really angry at a paper his father had released in an academic journal. That explained all of the added security. The drive up to the lake house nearly took two hours, but the sun was shining and the roads were clear. It was a sunny Thursday afternoon. Most people were still at work, guaranteeing no traffic. It was perfect. When they were in the car, he had Cinder put on a wig he had overnighted to his house. The long black hair made her features more severe, somehow. She was still shockingly beautiful, but he missed her soft brown hair, even though he had spent a portion of the night with her hair wrapped around his hand, against his shoulder, or tinkling against his chest. His mate riding him into oblivion was not something he should think about while driving. He couldn't focus on the road if he had a raging erection distracting him. His desire for Cinder died down just as they turned off the highway and drove through a small town. 
There was a general store with a small cafe and a few other shops, but not many businesses thrived here. The people who owned lake houses on Lake Samson were all weekend warriors or summer residents. It was the perfect place to hide out, really. The narrow dirt road that led to the Cooper Lake House was all but hidden by a line of trees. It was by design. You had to know where it was to find it. It was a trick, but one that would come in handy now that someone was after Cinder. This is like a whole other world, she commented as the SUV dipped through the deep ruts of the dirt road. It's worth it, I promise. Does your family usually have family dinners in the middle of the work week this far away from town down a super secluded road? She drummed her fingers against his thigh. Or did you perhaps trick me into coming out here? He winced. He should have known he couldn't hold one over his clever lady. The house wasn't safe anymore. It was only a matter of time before they came for you there. I can't defend you properly if I can't shift, and I can't shift in sight of humans. You shifted in front of me that day in the alley. Right, but that was for your own protection. And you already knew I was your mate, so you went all caveman on me. Forrest chuckled. If you say so. The road led him to a massive home made of timber and gray rock. It looked less like a lake house and more like a small rustic palace surrounded by lush forests and the lake below. His parents' white car and Fiona's minivan were already there. No doubt they had already done a quick sweep of the property as they settled in for the weekend. I should be nervous, right? Cinder asked as they grabbed their luggage from the trunk of the car. I'm about to meet your parents, and we've known each other all of two seconds. Forrest shrugged her bag over his shoulder. They are shifters. They knew they were made for each other as kids. Fiona was pregnant with her first kid two weeks after meeting Eduardo. We do things differently as shifters. Everything is faster and heightened. She giggled. I'll agree with heightened, but there was nothing fast about our sex-filled night. Maybe don't lead with that when talking with my mom. She snorted out a laugh. Yeah, right. It's bad enough that I'm just a normal human woman. I don't want your mom to know I stripped and seduced you our first night together. There is absolutely nothing normal about you, Cinder. You are extraordinary. She rolled her eyes as they got to the front door. Her fingers hovered by the doorbell. Wait, what am I to you? How do I present myself? Your girlfriend? We haven't even dated. Forrest felt a flash of anger. She was right. They hadn't dated. The coffee they had shared in the cafe was a lesson. Then he had saved her from the lions before bringing her to his house. That had hardly been conducive to dating. We are mates, and that is who you are to me. It is so much more than a girlfriend, though I am not pleased that we haven't dated. I will plan something nice for us this afternoon. But we are in the middle of nowhere. He grinned wide. But I'm a shifter with a few tricks up my sleeve. Have no fear, honey. I'll wine and dine you in our very own special way. And to think I gave it up already, she grumbled with good humor. Never going to regret that. It was a magical moment for me. You put me under your spell. He leaned down and pressed a kiss against her lips. The door swung open, and Marina, his mother, stood there with her hands on her hips. Why are you standing out there like lurkers instead of coming in? If you need time to chat amongst yourselves, at least come in, grab a bottle of wine, and head for the docks. Mom turned toward a stunned cinder. Hello, dear. I'm Marina Cooper, but you can call me Rena. Everyone does. Come, come. She pulled Cinder in for a hug. I can't tell you how happy I am that he has found you. You know, Ron and I were pretty sure he was just going to be one of those sad, lonely shifters who never find their mate. Thank the good Lord you came along. And you're just gorgeous. You'll make such cute babies. Mom, he groaned. She's not even through the door yet. Maybe wait until dinner to start talking about grandchildren, yeah? She waved him off and hooked her arm in cinders. Come, I'll introduce you to everyone while Forrest takes your bags upstairs to his room. Forrest wanted to argue, 
But there was no arguing with his mother when she had an idea in her head. She was focused on his mate, and there would be no tearing Cinder away until Rena knew everything there was to know about her. He ran up the stairs, stuffed their luggage into the closet, and ran back down the stairs to join his family on the deck. Son, good to see you. Dad placed a beer in his hand, clapping a strong hand at his back. Apparently, it takes you meeting your mate to call a family dinner. Usually, we only get those when your mother is antsy. Well, this needs more than just me. I have to make sure she is safe. Totally understandable. Cinder held a glass of wine in one hand, and with the other, she was turning a jump rope. Lucia was there, jumping on unsteady feet. The other end was held by Fiona, who was drilling Cinder with questions. Why strawberries? Well, I figure that the seeds are perfect for scrubbing away at dead skin. Instead of using little balls full of chemicals, use what nature has to offer. Fiona whistled. Brilliant, I love it. You okay, honey? He called out. Cinder answered with a wide smile. Oh, yes, thanks so much for having me. She nodded to mom and dad. I know this is less than the ideal way to meet your son's mate. Mom waved her off. Oh, please. Trouble comes with being a shifter. You'll get used to it. It comes with the territory. Do you think I could take the boat out in a little while? I'd like to give Cinder a tour of the lake. What a wonderful idea. Go pack a nice basket of snacks while we continue getting to know each other. She waved him off, dismissing him. Once again, he found he couldn't argue with his mother. Cinder was going to be basked in all of Marina's energy, and there was nothing he could do about it. Thirty minutes later, when Forrest had a wicker basket full of goodies and a bottle of wine, he found Cinder on the deck with the rest of his family. They were deep in conversation, laughing like they had known each other for a decade. His heart swelled up. Cinder Brady fit perfectly into his life. Now that he had found her, he wouldn't let her go. He wouldn't let anything happen to her, and he would make damn sure that his woman was as happy as she could be. Chapter 13 Cinder Cinder's cheeks were hurting from laughing so hard. The entire Cooper family was hilarious. They were welcoming and warm, and in many ways, they reminded her of her own family, she knew that the Bradys and the Coopers would get along fabulously. They were both hardworking and determined families. The only difference was that the Coopers sometimes turned into animals. If her dad was around, he'd make a joke about his girls turning into monsters once in a while, too. He was the only man in the house, and when Cinder and her two sisters and their mother had their period, dad had his work cut out for him. He was a professional hugger for Cinder, who always got emotional and weepy. He was encouraging for Ember, who lost her sense of taste, eating cookies that were on the wonky side. He was stern with Sparks, who would cry and cry that she was retaining water and lose her job on the town. And with his wife? Well, Dad would make her favorite meal and have her favorite wine and dark chocolate on hand. He held her, because Cinder fully got her weepy streak from her mother. Her father was the best sort of man. Others would have griped and complained about being surrounded by ladies, but not dad. He loved it and understood that whatever discomfort he felt when they were going through their monthly cycles, it was nothing compared to the surge of emotions pulsing through them. Cinder admired her dad. She always wanted to find a man who was similar in that respect, a man who wasn't afraid of putting aside his feelings when it wasn't about him. She didn't know her maid enough yet to discern if Forrest was that way, but she sure hoped so. Come on, he said, holding out his hands for her to take. I'm taking you out on a date. How fun, Marina cooed. Have fun, you two. Cinder waved her temporary goodbyes and let Forrest bring her down a set of steps that led them to a massive dock, there was a huge floating deck, loaded down with a gazebo with the nicest outside furniture Cinder had ever seen. There was a boat, a sort of mini-yacht, tied off to the side of the dock. Do you know how to drive that thing? 
she asked when he helped her into the craft. I do, yes. I wouldn't put you in danger. True. Fascinated, Cinder watched as Forrest made sure there was enough fuel in the boat, that they had life jackets and a flare gun. He also took out a blanket from a compartment under the seat. He explained that it could get cold and windy on the water and didn't want her to be uncomfortable. It was sweet as hell. She took the blanket with a smile and wrapped it around her bare legs when they set off. The lake was massive, and from what she could tell, it looked more like the ocean, but she was by no means a water expert. The wind was fast and cold as the boat sliced through the soft waves of the lake. They passed other boats, mindful of the few people fishing off their crafts. Forrest shouted over the wind, pointing out cool cottages, key landmarks, and sharing stories from his youth on the lake. Out here, he wasn't the high-strung mathematician who had been busting ass since he was a kid. He was just a man on his boat, having a good time. Even the rigid set of his shoulders relaxed. What's this island you're bringing me to? You'll see. It's a pretty secluded spot, and the shores are rocky, so not many people boat up to it. Most people swim to it. Oh, is that what we'll be doing? Forrest nodded. There's a swimsuit for you in the basket. She smiled at him. Aw, you've thought of everything. Yep. It makes up for you pretending that there was a family dinner. She arched a brow at him, no longer mad that he had lied to get her up here. She'd been furious when Fiona told her that Forrest had been the one to call a family meeting. But she had also explained how painful it was for a shifter to know that their mate was in danger. Shifters were a whole world she didn't quite understand. But having Fiona there to explain a few things was nice. Forrest's head snapped in her direction. Who spilled the beans? Your sister. She didn't mean anything by it. She just wanted to make sure that I knew you weren't an overbearing shifter, but that you wanted me someplace safe. I've got to say, if I hadn't heard it straight from her, completely unprompted, I don't know if I would believe that she's okay having her kids around a person who was recently attacked by two lion shifters. Forrest nodded. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to trick you into coming here. You lied, but I get why. I would have flat out refused to follow. I don't want anyone else to be in danger because I used my credit card. No more dumb moves from me. Not dumb. You could never be that, Cinder. You're just not accustomed to being targeted by people who would wish you harm. Yep, all because I make good organic products. Forrest grumbled something under his breath. I'm happy to have met your family. They're fun. You know, one of the first things that popped into my head is that our mothers would get along. That's great, honey. You won't lie to me anymore, though, right? I'd rather we fight out my lack of knowledge and understanding of what a shifter is than to have you fabricating truths to placate me. Forrest took a deep breath. Was it a lie? She snorted. Well, it sure wasn't a truth. Don't argue semantics with me, mister. A strawberry is a strawberry, just like one is one. You can't fudge the truth to make your life easier. We need to communicate with each other, right? The whole mate thing will only get us so far. Right, you're absolutely right. Forrest held out his hand to her, and she took it. He pulled her into his side and dropped a kiss on the crown on his head. You told me you were a determined woman. I took an educated guess that you wouldn't come willingly if you knew the rest of the family would be around, especially not the kids. You were right about that, but the lake house is pretty secluded, and unless someone was watching the house and recognized me in a black wig with brown eye contacts, I doubt we were followed. I won't use any of my credit cards, so we should be relatively safe. Exactly. She'd even called her sisters to let them know she was going to be taking a little trip with her mate without a cell phone. The device was off and tucked away in Forrest's safe back at his place. Your sister wants me to make us facial masks when I get back to the house. I think it would be a great bonding experience for us. Don't you agree? I sure do. Now grab the swimsuit and go change downstairs. Cinder's eyes nearly popped out of her head. Downstairs? Yeah, 
There's a sleeper compartment right there. He pointed to a trap door in the deck. My parents use this boat when they sail around to look for some of their species of study. And here I thought that as big cats, they would prefer to keep both feet on the ground. He chuckled. Suit, honey. We're almost there. Cinder opened the door and slowly made her way down the steps. It was a tiny space with a functional kitchen, a minuscule table, and a bed so small, she was sure that she'd have to lay down on Forrest to fit both of their bodies on it. It could be sort of romantic. She changed into the black one-piece swimsuit and tied her hair back. At least she didn't have to wear a wig out here. It was safely tucked away in their bedroom back at the lake house. I dropped the anchor, so we'll have to swim out. You ready? As he spoke, Forrest took off his shirt and unbuckled his pants. Cinder wasn't used to seeing her mate half naked yet. It made her mouth water, and her brain forgot any rational thought that wasn't let's fuck. Forrest chuckled. I know what you're thinking, honey. There's plenty of time for that later. For now, let's get our swim on. The water was a bit colder than she would have liked it to be, but her body quickly grew accustomed to it. Forrest swam with one hand, the other holding the basket over his head. Even then, he was a much faster swimmer than her. Here, I thought that cats didn't like water, she teased, after joining in on the rocky beach of the minuscule island. I like the water fine. I'm not a household pet, honey. I'm a killing machine, he winked at her. Does that mean you don't like to cuddle? Cinder traced a few droplets of water down his bare chest. He shivered under her touch. It pulled a smile out of her. She loved having such an impact on him. He was as affected by her as she was by him. Forrest dropped the basket onto the ground and wrapped his arms around her. His mouth found hers in a searing kiss. His tongue dipped into her mouth, and they explored each other with feverish kisses. Through the thin material of their swimsuits, Cinder could feel his erection. Do you think we can? He chuckled. Not here, no. I'm not taking the chance that some kid swims up to the island and gets a free show. Besides, it's lunchtime, and I promised you a date. He knelt down and pulled a blanket from the depths of the basket. He arranged it on a flat surface, a few feet away from the rocky shores. He sat down and proceeded to take out plastic drinkware and containers of food. It's not much, just some assorted cheeses and crackers with different kinds of cold cuts, but I've got wine. He patted the spot next to him, and Cinder plopped beside him. This is really sweet. Consider me wined and dined. Oh, I'm not done yet. He offered her a glass of red wine, and she took a sip of the delicious drink. Have you had many picnics here? She asked. Some, especially when Fiona and I were kids. We swam out here, and mom and dad would follow us on a kayak. Then we ate a bit of a snack here before heading back. You swam? Shifter children have a lot of energy. Damn, do half shifter children have the same level of energy? Because how in the hell am I meant to keep up? Forrest chuckled. You have me and that determination of yours. But I like where your mind went, honey. You want children? Only if they're with you. Even though I am fucking terrified. Do they come out as animal cubs? Is that even okay with my anatomy? Forrest burst into laughter, tears forming at the corner of his eyes before he was able to speak. No, honey. No, I told you. The first shift only happens at puberty. You'll give birth to babies like every other woman in the world. Good. Though I must insist that we have a girl. I won't stop until I have a baby girl. Deal. His smirk was devastatingly handsome. I guess we are failing at this dating thing pretty bad if we're sitting here talking about having kids. He shrugged. We can accept that we aren't like most couples and just be ourselves. If you want to sit here for hours and plan out our future, I'm okay with that. We just need to figure out who is after me before we plan too far ahead. That's fair. I wasn't able to get much information on the Hestons or the other company. A friend of mine has a private security company, and I've hired him to look into it. He's going to call the lake house as soon as he finds out anything of importance. 
Meanwhile, I've been thinking. The only reason why I need a large corporation to back me is that I need the space and resources to mass produce my products. But I don't really need Allure or the Hestons. I've been thinking, what if I contact Mr. Allure's granddaughter and try to poach her over to my side? She would have the name and maybe even the capital to get us a place to mass produce my products. And it would be a way out from under her grandfather's thumb. That's an idea. Have you ever spoken to her? A bit, here and there. She is a fan of what I do, but her grandfather keeps pretty strict tabs on her. Do you think... Forrest sat up, his shoulder coiled tight. Do you think that the lions could have threatened her somehow? Could that be why the grandfather is so reluctant to do business with anyone? To keep her so secure? A grown woman? Seems odd. Her eyes went wide. Shit, I didn't even think of that. I just thought he was a crotchety old man who didn't think women could be in charge of a large corporation. What if I severely underestimated this threat? Oh my God, Forrest, what if this old man isn't evil at all, but he's just some human man trying to protect his family? Forrest took a deep breath and munched on a cracker. Could be. We don't have enough information about any of this to know for sure. When we get back to the lake house, I'll call Vinny and see if he can look into her more closely. I feel like we need to do something now. There's this urgency inside me, and I don't want to sit here and wait for something bad to happen. Not that I am not enjoying this date. I just... Forrest cupped her cheek. Hey, I get it. It's hard to sit on the sidelines when shit is going down. But you wouldn't face off against an opponent without having all of the information, right? Before you use your ingredients in your products, you do research, correct? Well, yes. So this is just the research part of the plan. It just so happens that we outsourced the research phase to someone better at it. I don't like feeling useless. Forrest tugged at her until she sat on his lap. Cinder, please listen to me when I say this. There is nothing you can do right now because we don't know what to do. We need to assess, make a plan, and then act, okay? You can't beat yourself up about other people's behavior. You're a good person and you want to do good, I get that. But there are dangerous people out there who would take advantage of that. I know you're concerned for this other woman, but my main concern is and will always be your safety. We'll figure this out together. She took a deep breath and laid her forehead against his. I know. I just, this is all over makeup. No, honey, this is all about money. Money makes people do terrible things, even good people. I ruined our date by bringing all of this up. He kissed her temple. No, you didn't. This is real life, and we can't exactly hide from it, right? We're mates, a team. There's no roadmap for how to date a shifter the right way. Not when we're caught up in some intrigue. But how about this? When this is all over, we go spend a couple of weeks in Hawaii on a beautiful sandy beach. We can go on all of the dates you want. I'd like that, Forrest. That sounds perfect. Anything for you, my darling mate. Anything. He kissed her, and Cinder forgot all about the people who were after her. She melted in her mate's love, confident that everything would be okay, so long as she had him by her side. Chapter 14 Forest The weekend at the lake house was ideal to the point of making Forrest's heart ache with love for his family and his mate. They had all come together with such ease. It was difficult to remember that he had only just met Cinder. She got along with his sister. His mother adored her. The kids loved playing hide-and-seek with her. Even Eduardo enjoyed discussing plants' natural properties and how certain animals reacted to different fruits and leaves. Forrest's dad adored the shaving cream Cinder had made especially for him. They were one big happy family. But it had to come to an end. Not only had Vinny called with information, but the kids had to get back to learning, and the adults had to get back to work. 
Forrest realized he had been pretty silly to think this could all be fixed in a few days. They needed more time, time they didn't necessarily have. Fiona had no qualms about her kids missing more lessons, seeing how her children were just as genius as they were. But Forrest knew that the quiet and calm days at the lake house weren't real, not when there was someone out there who wanted to harm his mate. His family was leaving, and Vinny and some of his staff were on their way to go over what they had found out about the possible culprits. Forrest didn't like involving other people in his business, or in his mate's business, but they had very little choice. He was but one man. How was he supposed to save Cinder from a whole organization? He didn't even know who he was fighting against, and that didn't feel great. It was some alpha bullshit that would make Cinder crazy, he knew that, but he couldn't help it. It was just part of who he was, not only as a shifter, but as a man. He wanted to make sure that his mate was safe and secure. She was new to this world, the shifter world. And it was unfair that he hadn't been the one to show her how wonderful it could truly be. No, some asshole had robbed them of that by sending some lions to kill her. Forrest's gut churned painfully when he thought of what could have happened to Cinder all those days ago if he hadn't been with her. You're a million miles away. What's happening in that big head of yours? Cinder plopped down on the couch beside him in the library. The vast windows gave a perfect view of the lake below. The sunshine played tricks with the color of her hair, making her look like an angel. She squeezed his hand and gave him a smile. Are you trying to solve P versus NP again? He chuckled, despite the seriousness enveloping them. No, I'm just thinking. What about? Forrest tugged her forward and tucked her into his side. For the next little while, Vinny and his people will be here. We will have very little privacy. They will comb through every inch of your life, and they'll be around, just lurking to keep an eye on the situation. That's good, isn't it? He stiffened. Sure, honey. Cinder pushed away from him to get a better look at his face. What's wrong? He sighed and shook his head. Nothing. It'll all work out. No, Forrest, don't push me away. We already agreed that our start was a little weird and tense. We know we need to work on our communication, so out with it. Communicate. She poked his ribs, making light of the situation, which he really appreciated. If I wasn't a professor, a mathematician, maybe I would be able to protect you by myself. I wouldn't need other people to defend you. Cinder rolled her eyes. That's some shifter stuff, isn't it? Look, Forrest, I get that you're very protective and that this is seriously messing with your head, but I'm human. I don't expect you to come into my life and fix all of my problems, especially not this. When you're digging around to resolve hard problems or impossible math, do you sit there and look at the numbers and symbols alone? Or do you dig for answers and see what others have done and failed? Forrest held his breath. This is the same thing. You're just getting a bit of help. It doesn't make you less of a man or whatever toxic thing you've got in your head. I don't like that I can't handle this by myself. I really don't like thinking that something terrible could happen to you. I've only just found you, Cinder. I can't lose you. Not now, not ever. She leaned over and pressed a soft kiss to his cheek. Forrest, you domineering lunatic. Don't you see? Asking for help, getting Vinny and his crew here, it's the smart thing to do. We'll figure it out, and then you'll be stuck with me for so long you'll beg for some space. Not likely. I don't know. I'm pretty annoying. I can wake up in the middle of the night and decide to work on a moisturizer. We're alone for the last time in God knows how long. How about we take advantage of the situation and get into some fun kind of trouble? Cinder threw her leg over his side until she straddled him into the couch. You know what I think? I think you should mate me, for real, the whole bite thing before Vinny and his team get here. His eyes flashed. No. Cinder's shock was evident and made his heart clench. What do you mean, no? We have had no time to go out on dates like real people. We've rushed everything, but I am not rushing that. It's too important. 
She shook her head. But wouldn't it be a good thing, a protective thing? If you're my mate, you'll smell like me. You'll be easier to track for shifters. Now, in the ordinary world, you smelling like me is a good thing. It would let other shifters know not to mess with you. But when there is someone after you, it puts a target on your back. Cinder moved away from him and hopped to her feet. She crossed her arms across her breasts and stared him down. Are you telling me that you won't mate me? Not now, not until it's safe. But you just said it would mark me as off limits. So what's the problem? Cinder, listen to me. When I mate you, it won't be a rushed thing I do before a security team descends on us. I wouldn't do it when my family was here. I won't do it around a bunch of strangers. This is a personal thing between you and me. I won't rush what will bind us forever. Shotgun weddings are a thing, she argued. And that's not what I want for us. We both know our relationship has been fast-tracked, but this isn't the time. We'll wait until you're safe and settled into your new business. Let's give it a few months, maybe even a year. Excuse me, what now? His jaguar was not up with the plan. I am not waiting that long. What the hell is wrong with you? When did you start thinking like this? I didn't agree with this. We're mates. In case you haven't noticed, we've fucked a few times. That equals lovers in my head. That means equal footing. Why do you get to decide when and where you'll mate me? I'm part of this. You don't get to decide for us. This is something we decide for us. Please, Cinder, he sighed. I don't want to have this discussion right now. I've said my piece, and that's that. She growled low, every bit the shifter mate she was. No, we're going to have it, and you're going to listen to me, you grumpy old cat. I don't care that you're a decade older than me. You behave like a child sometimes, like right now, for example. You can't just decide to wait to mate me until I'm older and more settled into my career. You don't get to make that decision for both of us. That's something we do together. And let me be clear. It's not like I'm just barely into my 20s. I'm 27. I'm almost 30. I'm ready to start my future. I won't stand here and defend my life choices. But you live your life on social media. That's not something I like or am comfortable with. You need it to expand your business using your social media person. I don't want to stand in the way of that. We can be together, Cinder. I want us to be together, but not as mates. Not yet. Then it will be impossible to be apart, and I don't want anything to hold you back. We can wait. We have all the time in the world. I think you're wrong. I know. I think you're being a weird jerk. I know that too. I don't like you very much when you get all professorial on me. It's the way that I'm made, Cinder. I can't change it, just like I couldn't change the fact that I am a shifter. Let me know when Vinny and his people arrive. I need space from you right now. This is super hurtful, Forrest. I don't know why you're pushing me away. Because you don't think you deserve her. Because you think you won't be able to protect her. You're a lame-ass shifter right now. He didn't argue with his jaguar. Forrest watched her go, his heart heavy and his head confused. He had really believed that he would never have a mate. Now Cinder was in his life, and he didn't know what to do with it. What kind of mate could he really be to her? What kind of father could he be to their potential children if he had to get Vinny's help to protect what was his? For the first time in his life, Forrest doubted himself, not only as a shifter, but as a man. Did he even deserve to have a mate as wonderful as Cinder? No, probably not. Not if he couldn't keep danger at bay. She called him a weird jerk, and she wasn't too far off the mark. He felt weak, like a declawed kitten, powerless and useless. He had to wait for Vinny to come to give him the information he needed, he needed help to protect what was his. Maybe when this was all settled, he would come to terms with the fact he was weak. Maybe then he'd be okay with mating Cinder. There was still a lot that needed to be settled. Forrest didn't like the uncertainty coursing through his veins. It was like being held up by P versus MP. 
He knew how to start, but he couldn't anticipate the end results, and the rules kept on changing. Chapter 15 Cinder Cinder was fuming. If she had walked in front of a mirror, she would have seen smoke coming out of her ears. She was sure of it. Of all the fucking things that could be happening while she was in hiding from an unknown foe, begging her mate to mate her was the last possible thing she expected. Maybe she didn't understand shifter nature. Maybe she was a bit naive in thinking it was just a bite during sex. Obviously, it was more than that to Forrest. And perhaps she had fucked up by pressing the matter. Forrest wasn't behaving like himself. You don't know him enough to even know if that's true. Cinder ran up the steps and grabbed the phone on the bedside table of her room. Thankfully, she knew her sister's numbers by heart. Sparks answered after the second ring. Who's this? Her sister snapped. It's me. Sorry, I don't have my cell phone on me. Cinder, what's wrong? Why don't you have your phone? Has the world ended? It was common knowledge in her family that Cinder was permanently attached to her phone. Not only did she need it to take pictures of everything, but it was also her lifeline to her fans. She hadn't posted anything in nearly a week. You know there's a theory going around on social media that you died, and that's why you haven't posted anything in so long. I'm not dead, just not in a place where I can have my phone or post about things. Sounds ominous. Is everything okay? She sighed. Honestly? No. I'm having a tough time with this shifter thing. Do you think I could talk to Dash? Sparks dissolved into a fit of giggles. Judging by the sounds coming in through the receiver, she even dropped the phone. You know who my mate is, right? You remember me complaining about his lack of talking? Dash isn't a great talker. Try Kai. He doesn't talk much either. More than my guy. What's happening? Why can't I talk you through it? I really need a shifter perspective on this. Sparks sighed. Fine, let me see if he even wants to. There was more shuffling on the other end of the line. After a few minutes, Dash's deep voice grumbled a greeting. Thanks for talking to me. I need shifter help. Before Dash could say anything else, not that he would really, because he was a quiet stoic guy, Cinder told him everything, all of it, from the lion attack to their hiring Vinny, to the fight she'd just had with Forrest. Dash might not be a great talker, but the man could definitely listen. Mating is like a wedding in a way, but it's also so much more than that. It's our most sacred moment as shifters. I think the only thing that comes close to it is the first shift. Sounds like he wants to make it special. Nothing wrong with that. I did the same with Sparks. You can't rush this. Right, but Forrest says he wants to wait a year until my business is settled and all of this other bullshit. It's not bullshit to him, if I may. It's easy for us to be protective, but there is a cost to it. We can get into our own heads and warp reality pretty well. You mean like you not wanting to be with my sister because she had big dreams and you didn't know where you fit in? He chuckled. Yes, exactly. Is it possible he is harboring some similar feelings? He's a genius. He started an Ivy League college education when he was 15. Not sure why he would feel like there is no place for him in my life. Social media is painful for shifters. We have to be very careful with it as to not risk exposure. You live your life on screen, correct? And if you start your makeup line, you'll have to spend even more time on your phone, right? Well, fuck. Everything clicked in, sense snapping in her brain. That's gotta be it. Talk to him. I'm a different man, a different shifter. Now, what's this I hear about a threat? Cinder waved him off, even though he couldn't see her. It's nothing. It's all under control. We've got a team coming over, and we'll figure something out. Brady women do tend to attract trouble. The quiet man got a bit more information out of Cinder. But before long, the sound of the doorbell echoed through the lake house. She ended the conversation, thanking Dash for his insight into the shifter male psyche. 
Cinder raced down the stairs to answer the door, but Forrest beat her to it. He was letting in four men, each one loaded down by heavy-looking black suitcases straight out of a movie. She guessed there was surveillance equipment in there. Vinny, hey, Forrest said, shaking hands with a middle-aged man. His black hair had tiny streaks of white, but if it wasn't for that, it would be downright impossible to decipher his age. There wasn't a single wrinkle on the man's face, not even around his eyes or mouth. Either he had a great skincare routine, or he never expressed any emotion on his face. You must be Cinder, then. Vinny held out his hand. I am, yes. Good to meet you, I guess. It would be better if it wasn't under these circumstances, but what can you do? He turned toward Forrest. Where can we set up? Lots to do. The library. Forrest instructed Vinny and his men to follow him. Before long, scary computers with black screens and bold white writing overran the library's small table. Vinny plopped down in front of one and brought up a picture of Saffron Carlyle, Mr. Allure's granddaughter. This is Saffron Carlyle, who was set to inherit Allure when her grandmother died. She was raised by her grandparents after her mom and dad were killed in a crash. She was a toddler at the time. From the intel we gathered, the old man took hold of the company, stating to the board members that Saffron was too young and too inexperienced to run a multi-billion dollar company. Saffron hasn't been seen in public in a few months. All of her social media accounts have been deleted and scrubbed. Lucky for you, we have the best hackers in the business. The last thing she posted was a somber black and white picture of her parents' tombstones with the caption, sorry. I've got another team back in the city trying to track her down, see if she's okay. Cinder gasped. Do you think her grandfather has her locked up somewhere? I sure do. She just turned 25, the age at which Saffron should take over so he could retire. Oh my God. Something wasn't adding up. I have Saffron on my social media. She didn't delete her personal private account. She posted a picture last week. It had been a snap of a bottle of nail polish. Cinder remembered because the color had been a cool bright orange. Vinny's eyes flashed with interest, his fingers poised over the screen. Oh yeah? What's the handle? Cinder frowned. I don't remember. It's not her name. It was something like Spicy Flower or something like that. Spicy Flower? Vinny asked. That's basically what Saffron is. But why would she have a secret account? Vinny asked. Cinder didn't bother responding. Can you pull it up? Cinder shook her head. I don't have my phone with me, sorry. I could log on, she pointed to the computer. Sure, in a minute, there's more. He pulled up the next picture, this one of Matthias Carlyle, Mr. Allure himself. Carlyle was in Europe last month, and he only just returned last week. That's why we think Saffron is being held either in France or Germany. His bank accounts are pretty low for a man that runs a successful company. We were able to track down some of his transactions. He has been funneling money into some offshore bank accounts, all of which are based in countries that don't have an extradition policy with the United States. He's up to something illegal then, Forrest cut in. He's preparing for something. Seems like it, Vinny agreed. Oh, shit. He's preparing to give the business over to Saffron. He'll take all of the money and give her a drowning company. Vinny nodded at her. That's exactly the conclusion I came to. That's why Saffron has to be found. She technically has all of the power. If she were to walk into a board meeting at Allure, they would have to listen to her. She has 51% of the shares. That's why Evil Grandpa is taking all of the cash. With 49% of the money, he still has a lot to fund a new life out there. You're one smart cookie, Vinny told her, tapping his nose. What about the Hestons? Forrest asked. After all, they are the shifters in all of this. You mentioned Magenta Heston? Vinny scoffed. Rich people have the dumbest names for their kids. Anyway, 
Magenta is a second cousin to Belinda Heston, who runs the company. Vinny pulled up a picture of a woman who could have body doubled for Anna Wintour. Belinda doesn't have any kids, so all of her nieces and nephews are vying for the spot at the end of the table. Far as I can tell, Magenta is the forerunner. Makes sense. She is cutthroat enough. Magenta also has younger sisters, twins, Cherry and Candy. You can't make this shit up, really. They always work together. So they were probably the ones who attacked me under Magenta's orders. Yep. Vinny pulled up a picture of the twins. They were identical in an eerie way. Even their clothes were similar. But what is the purpose of attacking me? For my formulas? Heston Cosmetics has been losing big contracts to Allure over the last year. If you were to give your organic and cruelty-free formulas to the Hestons, I bet you anything, they would get their contracts back. So Forrest is right. None of this is about me or makeup. It's all about the money. Vinny nodded. Cash makes the world go round. What's our next step then? Cinder asked. If we know the Hestons are behind my attack, can't we just arrest them? Vinny laughed. No, we can't. Not only do I not have that power or jurisdiction, but we also have no proof. I was attacked, she argued. A flash of her attack popped into her brain. I was attacked by two lions in an alley and survived because a jaguar saved me. Vinny snapped his fingers. Exactly. We forwarded an anonymous tip to the IRS about the Allure accounts, and we also sent it to every board member. Maybe if they're too busy dealing with that, they'll forget that they want to come after formulas. That is if the Matthias Carlyle is behind this. My money is on the Hestons, who are actual lion shifters. Forrest began pacing. What do we have on them? Honestly? Vinny shook his head. We've got nothing on the Hestons, not on Magenta or the Twins. If they are doing anything illegal by human laws, they're experts at covering their tracks. I haven't found anything. What are we to do then? Forrest snapped. Stay in hiding until all of this blows over? I have an idea, Finney started. You're not going to like it. Doesn't matter what he likes, Cinder said. If it gets the lions off my back and gives me my freedom back, I'll do anything. Forrest frowned at her. You're not being held against your will in a dungeon like Saffron Carlisle. She nearly scoffed. They didn't even know if that was the case. No, but I would like to see my family, maybe check in with my followers, have a real life, maybe date. She added that last word to be poignant, and it landed. Forrest flinched. Was she being childish and petty? Absolutely, but he didn't want to mate her, her, the woman who was destined to be his. She needed space from him so that he could see what he was missing and so that she could get her head on straight. She was in love with the grumpy professor. It made no sense to her. They had a connection like nothing else. The sex was explosive, and they got along great. Except when it came to the future, something she had to think about, something... What do you need me to do? She asked Finney, ignoring Forrest's grumbles. Why do I feel like I just stepped on a landmine? The other shifter asked. Forrest ran a hand across his mouth. Tell us your plan. Vinny's frown was ruined by the mischievous glimmer in his eye. We use Cinder as bait, obviously. Chapter 16, Forest. Forrest's entire body had gone cold and still. He was too angry to have any other kind of reaction. Vinny was an old acquaintance. The man was a security genius, and he had a mate and kids of his own. Why he would come up with the plan of using Cinder as bait was beyond him. At least Cinder had enough good sense to not put herself in such danger. Of course. Cinder answered the other shifter. That makes a lot of sense. I can call Magenta and set up a meeting with her about the formulas. If she isn't responsible, we'll have a meeting and it'll all be okay. 
That will leave us with Matthias Carlyle as the only suspect. I'll be there with my crew. You'll be surrounded by my people, so there will never be any danger to you. But what would you say to her? It has to feel like nothing is wrong for her, you know? I'll ask her to draw up a contract or some lame-ass shit. It doesn't really matter, so long as we figure out if she's with us or against us. You're quiet. Why aren't you raging? This is a really dumb plan. Are you going to let your mate just go like that? Take on a crucial role in a shitty plan? And for what? Makeup formulas? Get your head out of your ass and protect our woman. Forrest felt the chuckle bubble out of him before he was able to stop himself. The next thing he knew, he was caught in a full belly laugh, unable to stop himself. You're both fucking <laughs> nuts to think. Another fit of laughter. To think that I would let my mate be used as bait. I get that you're mad at me, Cinder. But using this plan as a way to get back at me? No, enough. Vinny winced. I can tell this is a private conversation that needs to happen. I gotta drain the main vein. Call me back in once you figure your shit out. That will not be necessary, Cinder snapped. Let's do this. I'll call Magenta and have her meet us. We could set up at the general store in the small town not too far from here, Vinny added, eyeing Forrest nervously. It's not crowded or busy. We'd have full control of the environment. You really think you'll go through with this? Forrest asked, furious now. There was no more laughter. Everything was spinning way too fast, even his jaguar was stunned. Yep, I'm really doing this. I thought you said no more dumb moves. Cinder gasped, her angry surprise scenting the air. Excuse me, he said, leaving the library. As he retreated deeper into the house, he heard the conversation between Cinder and Vinny continue. It was a shitty plan, and he was surprised Vinny was going for it at all. The man's standards had slipped in his middle age. He needed to get some air and cool down before he went back into the library to develop a better plan. Something didn't feel right. Forrest made his way out onto the deck and down the stairs to the docks. It was a real testament to his distraction that he didn't see it coming. It wasn't until the electric current was seizing his body that he realized he'd been played. Tased with enough power to fell a large elephant, he fell to the ground. His eyes opened just long enough to see two identical lions pouncing toward him. Watching Forrest go was difficult, and it took all of her self-control not to run after him. He had made his decision. Forrest didn't want to be part of the solution because he didn't like the plan. Didn't he trust Vinny? He called him in the first place. Shouldn't they listen to the security experts' recommendations? Cinder was confident that she was doing the right thing, not only for her would-be company, but for herself. In the long run, Forrest would understand that she was doing it for him, too. For them. For the future they could have together, if he went ahead and made it her already. It took no time at all to get everything organized. Magenta would make the drive and meet them at the general store in an hour and a half. Vinny explained that it was a good thing that the lioness hadn't asked for a meeting place change. He and his people would have plenty of time to set everything up. The only issue they had was the formulas. Vinny wanted them, but Cinder was holding firm that no one got to see them but her. He didn't need to know that they were all in her brain. Cinder knew her stuff by heart, by design. It meant that her recipes could, under no circumstances, be stolen. She was the only one to know which base ingredients she used, who the vendors were, and so on. Spy movies gave her the idea. They always burned their correspondence to avoid being made. She protected her formulas like state secrets. As they drove away from the lake house toward the small town, Vinny asked her again. She insisted for the millionth time that she was not giving him a damn thing. He was pushy, but Cinder supposed that came with the territory of being a security expert. In fact, Cinder didn't think anything of Vinny's insistence until she spotted it. There was a black SUV following them. Uh, Vinny, I think we've got a tail. 
No, it's all good. It's one of my people, just a bit of backup. Cinder licked her lips, desperate to believe the man. The three other team members were in a car ahead of them. She wasn't aware of any other staff. Something wasn't right. The car was following too close behind. Wasn't the backup supposed to be the element of surprise? I can't believe Forrest didn't want to come, that he didn't even want to see me off. She was mostly talking to herself, but Vinny nodded from the driver's seat. She had to look in the rearview mirror from the back seat to get a read on his features. He was really mad that you wanted to be bait. I tried to get him to come around, but he is stubborn. It's a shifter thing. It's a shifter thing. Just like being protective of your mate was supposed to be a shifter thing. You'd think he would have come to rage at me some more or, at the very least, decided to come to make sure I was protected. A slow, cold shiver drew up her spine. A shifter thing. Forrest was so protective of her, of her dreams and aspirations, that he wanted to wait to mate her. He had saved her from the lions without thinking of his own safety. He had brought her to his place. He had even endangered his family by arranging the weekend at the lake house. Forrest would never let her leave the cottage without him, ever. No matter how angry he was, he would have shown up. Cinder sat up straighter in her seat and tugged at her jeans. She had to think and fast. One of two things was happening. Vinny was working for the Hestons or for Matthias Carlyle. That's why he wanted the formula. He wasn't trying to make sure they were safe. His whole mission was to get his hands on them. Vinny knew a lot about the Carlisle operation, the fact that Saffron was missing and hadn't been seen in a while. Could he have learned that from all of his snooping and hacking? Or was he the one keeping the poor woman somewhere? He had known little about the Hestons. The information he had on them was limited in comparison to the allure. Was this because he was hiding stuff from her for fear of revealing the plan? Or was it because he didn't know? What a fucking mess. She was so confused. Cinder wanted to be back in the lake house with Forrest. Shit, Forrest. The only way Vinny was able to get out of the house with her was if Forrest was incapacitated somehow, right? Her mate wouldn't have let her leave with someone who was out to get her. And to think this was all her fault. If only she hadn't trust Vinny. As discreetly as possible, Cinder rifled through her purse to find something that could be used as a weapon. It's not like she could call for help. She hadn't had a cell in almost a week. She had a nail file, a nail clipper, a mascara wand, and a few other odds and ends. It was hardly a Swiss army knife, but she could figure something out. Then she saw them, the tiny berries by the side of the road. Vinny, I hate to do this, but do you mind if we pull over? I have a nervous bladder. If I don't relieve myself soon, you're going to have a mess on your back seat. I'm just sort of overly nervous about being bait, you know? He chuckled. Huh, maybe she was wrong. But maybe she wasn't. She had to get back to the lake house and see Forrest for herself. Then everything would make sense again. But she was getting the distinct impression Vinny had tried to separate them on purpose. Sure thing. He pulled over the side of the road and took out his phone, probably to give her privacy, or to let others know he had the idiot cinder with him, and that soon they would be able to make lion chow out of her. Cinder ducked into the brush and went to work. She emptied out a small bottle of hand sanitizer and rubbed a bit of it everywhere on her exposed skin. She grabbed a few berries. Belladonna was poisonous. She could only hope that it would impact a shifter. Cinder squished the berries into the empty bottle of hand sanitizer. She shook it before dipping the metal nail file into it after using all of her strength and nail clipper to make the edge of it sharper. Her hands were numb from handling the poison, but maybe it would also dull her scent, along with the hand sanitizer. What's taking so long? Vinny called out. Just gotta... Fuck, fuck, fuck. Air things out. Wouldn't want a UTI. Ew, she heard the man mumbling before closing the car door again. Now was her chance to escape. She dumped her purse and its contents into the ground. 
I dropped my purse. Give me a second to grab my stuff. Then, well, then Cinder ran. Chapter 17, Cinder. Cinder had zero wilderness experience. If she was Sparks, she would be able to survive. Her sister was mated to an honest-to-God mountain man. Cinder was a social media influencer who mixed her own makeup. That didn't exactly translate to forest survival. Not when there was an undetermined amount of shifters after her, including Vinny, his three staff members, and whoever the fuck else was in the second car. Cinder was almost positive that it was Magenta. They were probably going to bring her to the very same location where they were keeping Saffron Carlisle. It was all speculation, of course. Cinder wouldn't know the truth until this was all resolved. But the very first thing she had to do was to find her way back to Forrest. She had to know if he was okay. And together, they could deal with Vinny and whoever had hired him to take her away. Cinder ran through the woods. Her thin tennis shoes, hardly the right footwear to go traipsing through the woods. But she had no choice but to keep getting back up every time she fell. And she fell a lot. Every time she ate dirt, she cursed herself, vowed to be more careful, but it was no use. She was trying to run by, making little to no noise, without leaving her scent behind, all the while holding onto her makeshift weapon and looking for the way back to the lake house. She didn't know much about surviving in the woods, but she knew she could orient herself better if she found the lake. She could recognize the other cottages across the lake and find the Cooper's place. If anything, she could also get in the water. If she swam for a bit, sure, she would be wet, but the shifters wouldn't be able to track her scent in the water, could they? They were probably going to make their way back to the lake house and wait for her there. Shit. She would be walking straight into a trap with no backup and no way of telling anyone they were in danger. And all for fucking makeup. Cinder grumbled to herself that she would never again wear her favorite berry lip balm or concoct another all-natural blush. She was done with this business if cutthroat shifters were going to keep harassing her. She continued walking in a straight line, her pace only increasing when she heard the sounds of a motorized boat. Had it not been for Forrest bringing her to the tiny island, she would have thought the sounds were coming from a motorcycle. That was lucky, and she let the one good sign fill her with hope. Cinder followed the sound until a break in the trees showed her the bank of the lake. She was at the other edge of the lake. From her vantage point, she could see the lake house. If she had to walk around at the edge of the lake, it would take hours. There was no telling how much time she'd have to swim to get to the building. She also didn't know if she could swim for that long. Not to mention the fact that she would be a sitting duck. Or a waiting makeup artist. Same thing, right? Cinder would also lose her only weapon in the water. Though her tricked out nail file wouldn't be saving any lives, she needed it. It was the only thing she had. The motorized boat passed, a kid shouting in glee from a tube being hauled at great speed. That's when Cinder got an idea. She had no idea if she could do it, but it was the only plan she had. Cinder made her way to the rocky beach's shores and tried to run to the first lake house. It was not easy on the uneven ground. The rocks poked through her shoes. The soft material split in a few spots. Unfortunately, the first cottage didn't have a boat. With a frustrated grunt, she moved on to the next. There was a tiny fishing boat that was at the very least 20 years old. The motor looked about ready to slide into the water in protest, but Cinder quietly begged it to not let her down. I've got no idea how to do this, she explained to the motor. Sorry if this hurts you. Thankfully, Sparks had a storyline in the town where she had to drive a boat. She'd explained to Cinder that to turn on the motor, you had to pull at this handle thing that was roped into the fuel tank. Or something. A small black handle stuck out of the motor. It reminded her of the lawnmower her dad had, he wrenched on the thing hard a few times to get the thing going. Might as well try, she mumbled to herself. Using all of her strength, Cinder pulled. Nothing, not even a sputter. 
She grabbed the handle again, bracing one leg on the side of the boat to give herself more power and leverage. She pulled with all her might. Slipping, she fell to the ground with a thunk. You motherfucker, she snapped at the motor. Why won't you cooperate with me? Cinder wiped her hands on her pants, smearing sweat and dirt on the already soiled white linen pants. She braced her foot on the side of the boat again, this time locking her knee. She gripped the handle, took a deep breath, closed her eyes, and ground her teeth down. Fuck boats, she shouted, pulling with all of her might. The motor roared in response, springing to life. Cinder stumbled back, her hands shaking from the exertion. But there was no time to look at the cuts in her hands. She untied the boat and started to steer away from the dock. It was not easy. To drive the boat, she had to use a stick as a steering wheel. It wasn't like driving a car at all. She drove the damn thing like a drunk sea captain. If anyone saw her, they'd call the cops or whoever monitored lakes for impaired driving. Good, then I'll have help. The boat didn't go very fast. Not that she knew how to go faster. She tried to keep her focus on driving, but her eyes also scanned the shores of the lake to see if anyone was after her. There were no signs of Vinny or any other shifter, but that didn't mean there weren't prowling predators in the woods. Maybe she should have broken into the cottage to see if there was a phone to call for help. Maybe she should have flagged down that leisure craft with the happy kid. But then she would have put other people in danger. No way, she had to limit the collateral damage. Cinder continued driving the boat, her mind reeling with the next part of her non-plan. Knowing that Vinny had probably driven back to the lake house, she brought the boat to a different dock. It was two cottages away from the Coopers, but she was reluctant to call them neighbors. That implied there was but a short distance between properties. This was lake country. Neighbors were a lost concept. She parked the boat, tying it off. She stared at it for a few seconds, unsure of how to turn the thing off. Surely it would idle away until it ran out of fuel, and then it would turn itself off. She didn't have time to fuck around with the craft. There was a mate to save and asses to kick. With her poisonous nail file clutched in one hand, she was as ready as she would ever be. Chapter 18 Forest Forrest Cooper was an intellectual, a man of numbers and rational thought. He was very rarely overcome by emotions he couldn't control. Animalistic urges were part of being a shifter, but he, as a man, had never felt murderous before. He was murderous just now. He had been felled by a taser. Surely this meant his attackers had used enough voltage to kill a fully grown man, if he hadn't been a shifter, he would be dead. He was sure of that. There was a tender spot at his back where the prongs had delivered their blow. Soon it would be healed enough, and he wouldn't even have an ounce of pain. But for now, he welcomed the reminder that he was about to kill some people. Two lionesses sat at each side of him while an older gentleman paced the room, hands behind his curved back. It didn't take a PhD to figure that the man was none other than Matthias Carlyle. How he had been able to hire Vinny's company was a mystery, but not one Forrest cared to uncover just now. First, he had to get away and figure out what they had done to his mate. Cinder was no longer in the lake house. He was positive of that. What's the plan here? He asked his captor. Forrest could have shifted right then and there and fought the two lions, then munched on the human. But he wanted to get some information before taking Carlyle as an afternoon snack. Shut up, Carlyle snarled. You come into my home, tase me, keep me hostage, and abscond with my mate. I'd say I've earned the right to know what this is all about. As Carlyle spoke, Forrest shifted his hands into paws. The zip ties used to bind him were no match for his jaguar. They split open like butter on a warm knife. Carlyle gestured to one of the lionesses, and she struck out with a paw, slicing through his shirt and flesh. Forrest didn't flinch. 
but he did make a silent vow to repay the blow in like. Are you taking Cinder to wherever it is you're keeping Saffron? Does the board know you're keeping your own grandchild hostage so you can keep running the company? I know you've been funneling money away from Allure. You don't know anything, Carlyle grumbled. You make it sound like I'm nothing more than a goon. Forrest chuckled. Because that's what you are. How did you get roped in with the Hestons? One of the lionesses growled low and menacingly toward the old man, taking one step toward him. Forrest saw the truth just then. Matthias Carlyle wasn't in charge of this operation. The Hestons were. You aren't the one keeping Saffron prisoner, and you're not the one funneling money into offshore accounts. Magenta Heston is doing that with her twin sisters. Carlyle spun around to face him, fear in his aged eyes. If your silly little girlfriend had just given them the formula, I tried to warn her away from the makeup business. You tried to keep Cinder away by telling her to get some classes and a degree first. The older man nodded. They already had my saffron. I didn't want another young woman in danger, but I couldn't exactly tell her point blank. The lions would have my head, then who would save my granddaughter? I suppose you're still alive as you tell me this, because these two have every intention of killing us. I wonder, why are we even still alive? Probably because the twins haven't had a chance to look at their phones and get their kill orders just yet. Forrest knew that he would have to shift into his Jaguar in a few seconds and pounce on Carlisle to keep him safe and fight off two lions. No big deal. If he could make a dent in impossible math equations, what was a fight with two other shifters? Just another Tuesday. I wonder one thing, Forrest said as he slowly moved his body, changing his position to make his plan of attack easier. How long have they had Saffron? Almost a week, Carlyle admitted with a sad sob. I get pictures of her every now and again, little notes they let her write. Why didn't you let her take the reins when she turned 25? Forrest asked, playing for time. The large grandfather clock was about to ring the hour, and the sound would be the perfect distraction for what he needed to do. Oh, we agreed that until the Hestons were no longer a threat, I would stay at the helm on paper. Saffron has been making decisions and business deals for at least a year now. She's a bright young woman, a true Carlyle through and through. She wasn't going to start doing business with Cinder until we were clear and free of the Hestons. Somehow, they found out that we were looking to go organic with Cinder's formulas. Let me guess, the security company you hired to protect Saffron is run by Vinny? Carlyle nodded. He betrayed me. You and me both. Carlyle, Forrest said as the seconds ticked closer. Duck! As soon as the grandfather clock sounded, Forrest let the shift overtake him. Startled by the sound, the lionesses pounced up onto all four paws. Forrest, half man, half jaguar, swiped a paw toward the lion on the left, slicing through the tender tendons of two of her legs. It would heal soon enough, but hopefully it would give him time to dispose of the other. Forrest didn't know where Carlyle had retreated to, but he couldn't let his focus be any more split than it already was. The injured lioness would be joining the fight soon, healed enough to help her twin sister. Forrest had no way of knowing if they were indeed Candy and Cherry Heston, but he would bet his life on it. Who the fuck else could it be? This whole situation had turned into one giant shifter clusterfuck. He had to dispose of the lioness twins, and then he would go save his mate. The uninjured lioness launched herself at him, and with a paw, she pinned him down to the ground. The library was big, but certainly not big enough to host a shifter fight. Furniture went flying. None of it would ever be the same again. It would all be broken beyond recognition. Forrest bit at his opponent, his teeth sinking into her neck. The painful howl had the animal leaping away from him. The other lioness was on him, swiping at him in retribution for what he had done to the sister. The animal scratched his eyes, her claws digging into the soft flesh above the socket. Blood streamed into his vision, making it impossible for him to see clearly. 
He leaped to his feet in an attempt to distance himself from his attacker while he blinked away the blood. He was just about to launch himself into the fray when a tiger and a male lion arrived out of nowhere. Forrest was one confused jaguar. For a terrifying moment, he didn't know if they were part of Vinny's staff. But when the lion pinned one of the lionesses to the ground, jowl closing around a striking paw, Forrest understood who the two newcomers were. They were Cinder's sister's mates. How they had come to find themselves in his lake house was beyond him. He didn't wait for another second. The lionesses were outnumbered now. Forrest lunged for the other big cat and bit out a considerable chunk of skin at her neck. He spat blood, fur, and flesh down on the ground. She wouldn't be moving again for the next little while. It would take time to heal. The remaining lioness mewled for her twin and swiped her uninjured paws at the lion on top of her. Forrest shifted back into his male form and knelt by the lioness. Who do you work for? Your sister Magenta? Are you working for Vinny? The lion backed off and sat back on his haunches. The lioness shifted into her human form and spat at him. You hurt my sister. You're nuts if you think I'll tell you anything. Where are you taking my mate? He wouldn't point out her hypocrisy. They had taken his mate, but would take issue at him retaliating? If anyone was a nut, it was them. You didn't fuck with his mate. It's too late, the lioness insisted. Cherry, is that who you are? Candy, she corrected with a scowl. Where are they taking Cinder? I'm not telling you. Forrest didn't hit women. Had he just fought her in her lion form? Yes. But this was different. He ground his teeth down. Tell me where Cinder is right now. He might have gotten an answer out of her had they not been interrupted. Six animals burst through the glass window of the library. It was a mess of fur, paws, and jaws. Forrest knew he was working with the lion and the tiger, but they were three against eight now. He had to include the twin lionesses in the growing list of foes. He faced off with a bear, swiping at the thick brown fur. An angry scratch bled steadily, but Forrest didn't relent. Not even when a saber tooth came at him from the side, the fight spilled out from the house, and anyone who drove by on the lake would have quite the show. There was no way to know how it would all end, and if he would ever get to lay eyes on his mate again. He hadn't even told her he loved her. There were too many opponents. Surely, he and his would-be brothers-in-law could only fight for so long before the numerous enemies won. It felt like a lost cause. Stop, motherfuckers, or I swear... I will destroy the formulas. Cinder was a shaking mess. She'd watched some animal shows before, where they showed big predators fighting for access to food. But witnessing a whole mess of animals tearing at each other all in the name of money? Enough was enough. This was just ridiculous. The fight continued all around as she stood on a large boulder, holding a stack of papers, she had a lit lighter under the papers, and she was giving the fray of fighting animals a serious stare down. The only jaguar, her forest, was looking at her intently, no doubt ready to pounce on her should one of their enemies lunge for her. Her plan was half-baked at best. She could only hope that no one noticed the papers were actually math worksheets Fiona had given her kids. She was well aware that shifters could smell a lie, but she wasn't lying. She would forget her formulas if one single person died here today. I mean it, I will destroy the formulas, she repeated, straining her vocal cords to be heard. Stop, the third lioness roared, taking her human form. Stop, Magenta ordered again. Don't be foolish, Cinder. You can't burn all of your hard work. Sure I can, it's not worth lives. Everyone shift back into your human forms now. One by one, each shifter took on their human bodies. There were a lot of naked men and women. It would have been hilarious if it wasn't so tense. Now, if someone drove by on the lake, it would look like a nudist colony was dealing with some pretty intense infighting. 
Drop the lighter, Magenta said. No, I won't do that until you and your people leave. But first, you have to tell me where you are keeping Saffron Carlisle. Not a chance, Magenta snapped. Put the lighter down. Cinder knew that in a matter of seconds, the lighter would become too hot. She would have to let go of the flame, but she'd take a singed finger if it helped rescue another woman. What was a fingertip anyway? If you tell me where you are holding her, I will give you these papers. It wasn't a lie. Cinder had every intention of handing over the math homework to Magenta. So what if there were no formulas written on the paper? Fine. She is being held in Belinda's flat in Paris. So your second cousin is involved in this? Magenta's smirk was evil. Sure. Holy shit, you've got Belinda locked up there too, don't you? The lioness shrugged. The papers, if you please. Cinder shook her head. I am not giving you these until some of the shifters here are gone. I need insurance that my family is safe. Big ask, little human. Those are my terms. She jutted out her chin in defiance. Come at me, you insane lioness. I've got my mate and brothers-in-law here. Magenta rolled her shoulders back. She would have looked way more in control had her tits not been flailing about. Vinny, take your men and get the fuck out of here. But, the man argued, you seriously fucked up this mission. If you want to be paid, get the hell out of here. I won't repeat myself. All of this for makeup? Cinder asked, as shifter security expert turned fuckwit, nodded to his men to back off. They went into the lake house, leaving the lake and the scene of the fight. Only Magenta and her sisters remained, one still grievously injured. At least now, if fighting resumed, the odds would be better. Forrest, Kai, and Dash versus two lionesses. Those weren't bad odds. Cinder waited until Vinny and his men were out of sight before she played up her reluctance at giving Magenta the papers. Tell me why makeup is so important to you. Magenta bellowed an ugly, vicious laugh. It's for the money, you twit. That's what you never understood. With control over Allure, Heston Cosmetic, and your formula, we will have no competition. Nice, real nice. You don't get to judge me, little human. Toss the papers. Cinder did just that. Magenta's smile was wide until she looked down. What the fuck is this? Maybe if you did your homework and did your own work instead of cheating, you'd recognize what homework looks like. Cinder was downright pleased with the jab. Magenta didn't like it. With a roar, she lunged for Cinder. Stop right there, a loud female voice echoed. Interpol, hands up in the air where I can see them. A woman, tall, commanding, and with a no-nonsense scowl, stared down Magenta. I'm Agent Amy Porath. You're surrounded. We might not be able to kill shifters, but our tasers can take out a one-ton elephant. Try me. I want to see what it does to a shifter. The taser was enormous, way bigger than the ones rent-a-cops had in malls. We've already apprehended Vinny and his associates. Oh, Agent Porath clicked her tongue. There is another team in Paris rescuing Belinda and Saffron. Thanks for that. Magenta, Candy, and Cherry Heston, you are all under arrest for extortion, racketeering, and kidnapping. There's a whole list of other things. She rattled off a long string of other charges, each sounding worse than the last, even including murder. I fucking hate you, Magenta spat at Cinder. Feeling is mutual, I assure you. Cuff them, Agent Porath ordered to a dozen agents. One of the men stood out from the rest in a tan-colored uniform, keeping close to Agent Porath. Cinder hadn't recognized him at first sight. She'd only met the man once at a dinner at her sister Sparks' home on the mountain. Clark, what are you doing here? The man was a forest ranger and Chris's mate, who in turn was Dash's alpha. The forest surrounding the lake is in my jurisdiction, when you called Dash and Sparks, they traced your call to here. They called it in to me, and I reached out to Interpol. I was already in town tracking Magenta. 
European authorities have been trying to get to her since Belinda Heston went missing, Agent Porath explained as the three lionesses were taken away. Cinder's head was reeling, and she was trying to pay attention to everything Agent Porath and Clark were saying. Still, it was difficult because there was a very naked, bloody, and concerned jaguar shifter heading right for her. She was in the middle of getting a sort of debriefing from Agent Porath and Clark when Forrest took her in his arms and crushed her into his body as if he could absorb her to protect her from the aftermath of the fight. You're okay, he whispered against her hair. You're okay. Yes, I'm fine. You just stood in front of a half a dozen shifters and took full control of the situation. He pulled away, keeping her in the circle of his arms. His eyes were full of concern and admiration. Who are you, Cinder Brady? Your mate, she answered. You're right about that, he growled before capturing her lips in a kiss. I'm sorry you had to save yourself and all of us. I'm not, she said truthfully. But that's what mates are for, he argued, pressing his lips to her forehead. Exactly, she cooed before returning the kiss. It goes both ways, Forrest Cooper. We fought together. But maybe the next time, we don't let a scheming asshole come between us. There won't be a next time, he promised. Now, let's get out of here. There's something we need to do. Oh, she asked, knowing exactly what he meant. We need to have a long conversation, he said with a wink. Then we will get to the fun bit. Homework before playing, she teased. Something like that, but, Forrest sobered. Communicating openly will never be a chore again, Cinder. I vow that much to you at this moment. He sealed his words with a kiss, and Cinder knew they would be okay. Together, they could overcome anything. Epilogue, Cinder. As it turns out, Forrest's plans of leaving the wreckage of the lake house hadn't been that easy. Agent Amy Porath had a million questions for them. The entire debriefing process took even longer when Ember and Sparks showed up in a flurry of activity. They brought pizzas and sodas for the whole gang, which consisted of all three Brady sisters, their mates, Clark and Chris and Amy. As it turns out, Interpol had been concerned about Belinda Heston for months. She had stopped showing up for work, and her personal assistant had filed a missing persons report. There was nothing the local police could do, seeing as Belinda was sending emails and answering calls from her home in Paris. She claimed to need a break from the United States, desperate for the glitz of Paris. Now, Amy was sure Magenta and her sisters were responsible for all of those calls and emails. The three sisters wanted control of the Heston Cosmetics Company. For a long time, Belinda had wanted to will them the company at the time of her death, but the older woman had seen unsavory behavior in her second cousins. She had changed the heir to another relative. Furious, Magenta had zeroed in on Allure. The company headed by Saffron and Matthias Carlyle had steadily been gaining popularity. The Hestons were losing business to the Carlyles, Cinder figured it was because Saffron was working in the background, pulling all kinds of strings. She had made a grave mistake by assuming that Matthias Carlyle was keeping his granddaughter in a dungeon somewhere. It was further from the truth. She was hiding to avoid the wrath of Magenta. The issue, of course, was that Carlyle had unwittingly hired Vinny's company to secure Saffron. The old man couldn't have known that the shifter was in league with Magenta Heston, Saffron had been delivered to their enemies. It was then that Magenta had approached Carlyle. He had to get the organic formulas from Cinder. Instead of doing as ordered, he had done his level best to keep Cinder away, without actually giving her a warning for fear of putting Saffron in any more danger. Matthias Carlyle didn't care if Cinder had a formal education. He was a grandpa who didn't want people to get hurt, he had sent an anonymous distress message to Interpol. Amy had already been aware of the strange happenings with the Heston Company. Her investigation had led her straight to town, right into Cinder's lap. 
it was lucky, in a way. Or so the consensus was as the group of shifters and humans devoured copious amounts of pizza. Amy promised to keep them all abreast of the investigation's outcome. Still, the agent was pretty confident all three Heston sisters and Vinny and his employees would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. With that revelation, Cinder noticed just how much calmer Forrest became. He didn't have to worry about reprisals if the Hestons were released. They wouldn't be, not with all of the shit they had done in the name of money. Cinder was sad that three smart young women hadn't used their intelligence for good, but it took all kinds of people to make a world. Apparently, that included people who had no morals or no sense of right and wrong. But now that she knew that Matthias Carlyle wasn't opposed to doing business with her, she was optimistic that soon enough, she would be sitting in a meeting with the grandfather and granddaughter duo to plan out a Cinder Brady product line under the company's umbrella. She had a good feeling about the future. It was all going to work out. She was sure of it, especially with her mate by her side. She nuzzled into Forrest's side when the sun was setting over the mess of the lake house. After a quick call to a local contractor, Forrest said goodbye to everyone and loaded Cinder in the car. He was antsy, and she could only guess that he wanted nothing more than to cuddle his mate after the stressful day they had. He probably wanted to spend some quality time alone, just the two of them, most likely naked and in his bed. Cinder wasn't opposed to that. In fact, she had plans of her own. The moon was beginning its slow climb across the sky as they drove back into the city. Forrest reached out for her hand and placed it on his lap, intertwining their fingers. His thumb drew a pattern against hers. I need to apologize to you, Cinder. What? Why? Forrest sighed. I should never have walked away from you in the library earlier. I left you with an enemy who took you away from me. I should have stayed and argued with you, but you needed space because you're not used to having your demands met immediately. She gave him a small smile so he would know she wasn't being harsh. She just knew how he thought. That doesn't make me sound too good, does it? She shrugged. No, but I know who you are, Forrest. You're a grumpy professor who likes rules and order. I came into your life barely a week ago, and I flipped your whole world upside down. There's no more order, and the rules you've always lived by have gone straight out of the window. It doesn't excuse me leaving. I needed time to get my thoughts in order. I was going to go out on the deck and think. As if our whole situation was one big mathematical equation. He chuckled and squeezed her hand. Something like that, yes. But before I could even lean into the silence and take a metaphorical step back to see the whole problem, I was tased. I would never have let Vinny take you. You have to know that. I do. I want to point something out, but you've got to promise that you won't get mad. Forrest flinched. That doesn't sound too good. Let me explain, okay? You are a shifter, which comes with some pretty interesting ideas about masculinity and who saves who. But I think that today, I proved that it's not about who saves who. It's about doing your damn best to be there for the other when shit goes down. Not just with your mate, but with family too. Just like your family came over to spend the weekend with us. Just like Kai and Dash came to my aid. You don't feel like less of a man because they came to help, right? Forrest frowned at the road up ahead. No, I didn't. I wouldn't have been able to fight off all of those shifters alone. Exactly. Math can be done mostly alone, right? But not real life. Let me in, Forrest Cooper. We can tackle all of those life problems together. Promise me that no other big cosmetic company will take you away from me. Cinder giggled. Only my own, but never for long. I'll always come back to you, Professor Grumpy. One of the things that upset me the most when you were taken was that I never got to tell you just how much I love you. Because I do, Cinder. I love you, even when you drive me insane and declare that you'll let yourself be bait. I love you too, Forrest Cooper. And I promise not to offer myself as bait again. 
standing on that boulder was way too scary. You didn't even smell afraid, Cinder. That's why I know you'll conquer the world. Fuck yeah, I will. But first, pedal to the meadow forest. I'm going to rock your world. He wouldn't be told twice. The brownstone was very quiet. There was not a sound in the darkened front hall when they entered Forrest's home. It was a stark contrast to the rest of their day. Cinder welcomed the silence. She took a deep breath and kicked off her shoes. The first night she had spent in this house, she had lured Forrest to his own bed by stripping for him on the way up the stairs. She wondered if she would have to do the same now that she wanted Forrest to mate her. He hadn't brought up the topic on the drive over, but she wouldn't relent. They almost lost each other today, and she wasn't willing to go through that again. Not for money, not for all the fame in the world, not for the best cosmetic contract she could imagine. Having someone to share those possible achievements with was infinitely better, and that person was Forrest Cooper, the grumpiest mathematician to have ever lived. Cinder, Forrest whispered, cupping her face in his hands. His thumbs rubbed her heated cheeks softly as he dropped a sweet kiss against her lips. Yes, Forrest, she murmured back. It's time. He pressed another kiss before stepping away from her. He pulled his shirt over his head and threw it over his shoulder. He winked at her, a smirk doing devilish things to his features. He turned his back to her and headed toward the stairs. He wiped his belt off, letting it fall to the ground. His slacks fell to the ground, his perfect ass encased in tight black boxer briefs. He looked at her over his shoulder, much like she had that first night. He winked again, sending waves of need coursing through her. Never, not once in her life, had she been this turned on. You know where I'll be, honey. He slowly made his way up the steps, his ass working through the motion. Cinder stayed glued to the bottom step, too mesmerized to move. Was it possible that he had the very same idea as her? It sure looked like sex was on the table, but would it be mating? Fuck, she hoped so. With a deep breath, Cinder climbed up the stairs and made her way down the hall. When she arrived in the master suite, Forrest was lying on the bed, smirking at her. Took you long enough, he chuckled. Cinder giggled. I wasn't too sure what I would be walking into. Sure you did. He pushed off his underwear. His long, thick erection stood proud. Her mouth went dry, her pussy went wet, and she felt dizzy with anticipation. What are you waiting for, honey? Forrest patted the bed beside him. Cinder dropped her linen pants, knowing he would go a little insane when he realized she was wearing a tan-colored thong. Slowly, she undid each button of her blouse, drawing out the moment. Forrest's eyes were burning, and he seemed to be seconds away from leaping at her. With a hand across her breasts to hide the goods for a moment longer, she took off her bra. If you're trying to make me insane, it's working, he growled. Get over here. He didn't even finish his sentence before he came for her. Her breath caught, not knowing what he would do. The last thing she expected was for him to fall at her knees, but that is precisely what he did. His mouth brushed against her pussy in a soft kiss. She moaned, her hands tangling in his hair to keep herself up and steady. Forrest continued kissing her, her hips, the soft curve of her belly, her mound. He was basically worshiping her body with kisses. It was sweet torture, and she wanted so much more. Before she lost her mind, his tongue delved between her lips, hitting against her clit. With his fingers, he spread her outer lips wide to better gain access to her. Her knees buckled under her, but she ordered her limbs to stay steady. She wanted this more than she wanted her next breath. Fuck, honey, you taste so good. You are so wet for me, and I am not going to waste a drop of you. To prove his point, he laughed at her core, sipping her juice like a fine wine. He sucked her hardened clit into his mouth, leaving her writhing and panting. Her legs shook as her orgasm tethered somewhere at her center. 
Forrest gripped her ass and hooked one of her legs over his shoulder, giving him even more access to her. His other hand went to her pussy, pumping into her with a few hooked fingers. It hit a magic spot inside of her as he suckled her clit. His teeth grazed the nub, and her only remaining standing leg shook. Forrest, I'll fall. I won't let you, he growled before twirling his tongue around her clit with such rapidity it stole the breath right out of her lungs. Cinder gripped his hair, sparks of pleasure going off inside of her. Forrest continued his ministrations as Cinder rode the waves of pleasure. Her entire body shook with the release. Forrest didn't stop, his fingers still buried deep inside of her. He continued taking leisurely strokes of her pussy, lazily pumping his fingers until the shaking had subsided. He got to his feet, letting his hands caress every inch of her body as he went along. The smooth, hard skin of his erection pressed into her belly, and Cinder reached down to grip it hard. The tip was moist, weeping in excitement. Forrest Cooper, will you mate me? Absolutely, Cinder. With no warning, he gripped her ass and lifted her off the floor to deposit her on the side of the bed. Cinder sat up, legs splayed for him. Forrest stood between her legs, his erection pressing into her. He leaned down to close his mouth around one nipple, his tongue curling around the nub in an imitation of the treatment he had just given her clit. She arched her back into the embrace. Forrest moved to the other breast, tweaking the cold and lonely nipple with his fingers. I want you inside of me, Forrest. You can keep mauling my tits when you are buried deep inside of me. Fuck that mouth, she giggled. What about it? She sat up on her elbows. It speaks the truth. I am so ready for you, Forrest. I see that, honey. He trailed a finger down her slit. With Cinder lying back on the side of the bed, with Forrest standing between her legs, he ran his cock against the length of her, tapping her clit with a wicked grin on his face. Is this what you want, honey? She mewled, arching off the bed. You know it is. With permission granted, Forrest took himself in hand and drove home, bottoming out. With his hands, he held her hips an inch off the bed, his cock reaching new depths. It was a surprise and a half. She cried out when he eased out to pound in again. She was breathless, writhing under him, trying to meet him thrust for thrust. You are so damn beautiful when you are racing toward an orgasm. You blush, and you grip my cock like a vice. Fuck, honey, it is almost too much. He dove for her breasts, lavishing them with all kinds of love bites and sucks. His hips moved at a rhythm that was only possible because of his heritage. But it was perfect, just what she needed. Bracing her knees against the bed, she pushed herself up onto his cock as he continued to thrust into her. Her legs shook, her breath caught, and she cried out as she saw stars and the whole damn universe behind her eyelids. The orgasm was endless, one wave of pleasure after the other. Forrest didn't stop. Instead, one hand went between them where they were connected. After two orgasms, her clit was so sensitive, it almost hurt to be touched again. But fuck did she want it. Don't stop, she whined. Wouldn't dream of it, honey, he growled, giving her another toe-curling orgasm. This time, when she went over the edge, she felt Forrest stiffen above her. He roared her name before his teeth dug into her left breast. The release became impossibly heightened. Her body shook as she realized what had happened. He was coming deep inside of her while she milked his cock for everything he had. And he had made it her. Deep inside of her, in her skin, Forrest was everywhere. He continued moving his hips slowly as they both trembled through the afterwaves. When he pulled out, Forrest took her in his arms and gently laid them down side by side. So, we are mates now, she whispered against his heart. We are. Good, she moaned. The perfect way to end this day. She kissed the spot over his thundering heart. 
I love you, grumpy professor. I love you, you brilliant, courageous woman. You will take the world by storm, and I can't wait to watch it all happening. Cinder sat up, keeping her hands on her jaguar mate. I just thought of the perfect product. What? His eyes went wide. After that? Yeah, she giggled. I'm going to call it the forest equation, a male fragrance to capture this moment. I'm thinking pine and sandalwood and... Forrest sat up and kissed her. You are not going anywhere, honey. She giggled into the kiss. I didn't mean I would get to work right this second. I'm not done with you yet. Cinder pushed him down in the bed and straddled him. She trailed her lips down his chest and back up, all the way over to his heart. She bit down softly, earning herself a soft hiss from him. I have mated you now too, Forrest Cooper. My mate forever. Until P versus MP gets solved, he said before kissing her shoulder. Don't worry, he said with a wink. It is impossible math. It means forever. The End About the Author New York Times and USA Today bestseller. Hi. I'm Millie Taden. I love to write sexy stories featuring fun, sassy heroines with curves and growly alpha males with fur. My books are a great way to satisfy your craving for paranormal romance with action, humor, suspense, and happily ever afters. I live in Florida with my hubby, our son, and our fur babies, Speedy, Stormy, and Teddy. I have a serious addiction to chocolate and cake. I love to meet new readers, so come sign up for my newsletter and check out my Facebook page. We always have lots of fun stuff going on there. Sign up for Millie's newsletter for latest news. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash EEPURL dot com forward slash PT nine Q one. Find out more about Millie here. WWW dot Millie dot com. Millie at MillieTaden.com. We hope you've enjoyed this production of Mating Cinder, Pride of Alphas, Book 3 by Millie Taden. Narrated for you by Cassandra Miles. This has been a Findaway Audio Works production presented by Orange Sky Audio. Copyright 2021 by Millie Taden. Published by arrangement with Stonesong. Production copyright 2021 by Orange Sky Audio. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening.